10.01 Pacific time. Um, by the way, everybody, I'm in Southern California today for the SPJ Region 11 conference, which has 150 people registered, so that's a good sign. Anyway, thank you for joining us for our board meeting. This is a special meeting for the bylaws amendments. And yes, I'll turn it over to you, Claire. Okay, and I see that we're recording, so we're good to go. Rebecca Aguilar. Here. Claire Regan, I'm here. Yvette Davila Richards, waiting. And Israel Balderas. Here. Emily Block. Present. Daniela Ibarra. Here. Danielle McLean. Raphael just explained that he's coming back in. I'm here, but yes. So. Okay. No, gotcha. And Cheryl Smith. Here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, let me start with this. I'm going to open up with a few remarks. And again, I'm not trying to make this a long meeting today because we have a lot to discuss. But I just want to say that it has been a good two years with John Scherzer. But now our executive director is moving on to another opportunity at another nonprofit where he will continue growing as a professional. We, the board and the membership, appreciate that John helped SPJ become a bigger and stronger organization through his projects and many of his programs that he implemented. John, I'd like you to share a few words if you'd like to tell us where you're going and what you'll be doing. Uh, thanks. Um, sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. So. Um... The and uh, it's almost it's been almost three years, so I don't want to shortchange oh. um, my tenure here uh, too much. Uh, and I um, will miss working for the mission of this organization and for the foundation as well. Um, so many wonderful people in this organization, um, many on um, everyone on this call, and any and many beyond um, who I've come to interact with, even virtually in the in the three years I've been here. Which two uh, probably entirely two of those has been with the pandemic um, uh, affecting us as well. So I started in December, the pandemic hit in March and it was uh, it was definitely an interesting time, time since then. But um, I'm taking a position as the executive director of the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. Um, it's an organization that raises money and shows and supports um, uh, veterans and especially those who have received the Medal of Honor um, from the President of the United States. and their headquarters is in Charleston, South Carolina, but I'll be working remotely from my location here in Indianapolis, which will be convenient as I help the other staff members transition, um, hopefully uh, effectively. Um, but it's uh, it's going to be, I think, a, a nice uh, fit for me and, and a good opportunity. So um, so anyway, I um, who knows if I, I might have some more to say at some point, some nicer, some nice words as well. I wish I could be with you all in DC, it would be nice to have actually experienced an in-person convention for once, um, but I, uh, I really appreciate the, the opportunity you gave me to, to serve our members and um, the, the great mission of these organizations. Thank you, John. I appreciate saying that. And, you know, as journalists, we're always looking for stories. So those Congressional Medal of Honors, you know, they're always a story there. So keep us in the loop because we always want to do stories on those, those great individuals. And um, so a lot of you out there, are, are saying, I've seen emails, uh, what happens now? Well, the board and I are negotiating a process with a possible candidate for the interim ED position. We're very close on this agreement. At this time, I'm not at liberty to say who that person is, but it's someone who comes highly recommended by John and others. We hope to name that person very soon. The SPJ board, along with the SPJ foundation board, will follow the SPJ laws, bylaws, and policies and we will put together a search committee that will include five individuals. I will appoint two members to the search committee and the chair, and the foundation will appoint two representatives. That committee representing both boards will hopefully help us find a consulting firm that can help or the organization find candidates for the executive director position. Now the consulting firm will provide the SPJ search committee, again, those five, at least three names of possible candidates. That search committee will decide who are the top two candidates? And those two names will be given to the SPJ board to select the next executive director with the input of the SPJ foundation president. So during the process, we will keep the SPJ foundation board president informed and of course, seek input. 
as president of SPJ, I want to make sure that this is a very fair process that focuses, again, this key word, focuses on finding a new executive director. And what I want to avoid is what happened two years ago, when I believe the process got a little messy and some people were unfairly caught in the crossfire. But that's the past. This is the present. Please have confidence that the SPJ leadership will get the job done. We will be going into executive session, by the way, to the, today to decide on the FOI awards. Okay, I'm gonna open up to public comments, but today they will be brief because again, this is a special board meeting focused on bylaws amendments. I want you to be positive and productive, including in the chat. Remember this will be posted, this video, including the chat, which is public information. All of you get two minutes, and President-elect Claire Regan will let you know when you have 30 seconds left. Okay, so let me open up the floor. Again, we're going to keep it brief. Anybody, raise your hand if you want to. I see Yvette Davila Richards has joined us. Hi, Yvette. Um, all right, so who's got a hand up? Uh, Claire, do you see anybody? Anybody? Wow, you guys yeah. make these? Yes, who? Jennifer. All right. Thank you, Jennifer, for always coming to our meetings. I appreciate the support. Yes, what do you have to say? Um, so according to the FPG board policy manual, SPJ national meetings must follow the spirit of open meeting laws. It even outlines how in rare situations, if there is an emergency board meeting with less than 24 hours, to provide notice, information shall be sent out via the quickest means possible. Um, as we would expect from government agencies they cover, um, it should be interpreted that executive sessions um, if they're needed by the board should come first before the public, explain the reason for the executive session, meet and then return to a public meeting for the vote if it's needed. Um, I've learned of instances um, in which the board has met uh, without providing notice to the membership uh, in executive session. You know, recently the board met in executive session regarding the resignation of our executive director. And I've emailed yeah. Rebecca and Claire asking directly if this happened, but I got no response. Um, in a nominations committee webinar, uh, everything you wanted to know about running a uh, running for a elected position that's posted on YouTube, I recall that Rebecca said uh, that the board had been great to accommodate emergency meetings, even meeting late on a Sunday evening, and yet there hadn't been any Sunday night meetings made public that I'm aware of. Um, the lack of transparency has been an issue with committees also, um, as members have been excluded from observing. Uh, I think in the spirit of open meeting laws that the board policy manual says SPJ member, uh, SPJ national meetings must hold, uh, those should also apply to committee meetings. Th as 30 seconds, Jennifer, 30 seconds entities that we cover. Um, just regarding the delegate task force recommendations, I believe that if they had been allowed to have public comments in those meetings prior to presenting the recommendations, we'd have more options than just the one of eliminating uh, delegates. And I just hope that we can, moving forward, move, work in the most transparent way possible. Well, thank you, Jennifer. First of all, my board is about full transparency. So it's unfortunate that you look at it in that perspective. As it concerns any executive director meetings, while I believe that, you know, of course, letting everybody know, the meeting that we had was a personnel issue where we were discussing financial things. And so I bring that to you to tell you that, uh, because I, I do not um, believe the the part that we're not transparent, I think we're very transparent. I think that our committees are transparent. We put everything on video, it's always out there. So it's unfortunate that you have that perspective, uh, but you know what, I respect your opinion. Um, it doesn't mean I agree with you. And you know, when I go into executive session and, uh, and they're emergency ones where it's like, you know, I have a few hours, you can ask the board members, I have a few hours, can you meet me? Can we meet on this? It is a personnel issue. The attorney is usually there because it's privileged information. Um, and so one of the things that I, uh, and most people have known me, especially in my 41 years as a reporter, I'm super transparent. I put everything out there, got nothing to hide because why should I? So thank you for your um, detailed information. I appreciate it and I take it into consideration.
Thank you. Who's next? Anybody? Hi, Erwin. Good seeing you. Anybody? All right. One uh, last time. Uh, Claire, do you see anybody else? Mm, no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, were you waving, Cheryl? I mean, this is public I mean, comment. Right. This I just was going to say that everyone should look at Israel's comments in the chat. All right. And can you read those off for me? Because again, I don't look at the Oh, and by the way, yeah, Israel is my designated parliamentarian for this meeting, always is. So you want to read that off to us, Israel? Feel free. Uh, yeah, I'm reading for, from the uh, SPJ bylaws, section, article seven, section seven, all meetings shall be open to the public, except, the word is except, when the board is discussing confidential matters, including, and again, the key word is, but not limited to personnel privileged communications with legal counsel and contracts. Thank you very much. And that should answer your question because most of them had legal counsel. No, all of them did. Mark Balin was it. Okay. So again, that's it. And nobody else, no raised hands. Well, thank you. First of all, I appreciate everybody who's shown up for the board meeting. Good to see everybody on this Saturday. Um, so now let me move around here. Okay, so we're gonna go right into the bylaws mm -hmm. committee report. Alex Truquanio, you have the floor. Please take your time going through this just because First of all, Alex, I want to say thank you. Thank you because this whole bylaws thing can be very complicated and very detailed. And I appreciate you and your committee that's put so much effort into making it in plain English to us. So I want to thank you publicly, but you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Rebecca. It's obviously been a, a long year working on um, the bylaws with the task force. Um, uh, and I don't know if any of us really expected that it would um, be this involved and come this far in um, almost 12 months since uh, the delegates voted to create the task force um, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, so, um, and first, I just want to begin by saying, you know, this is, of course, been an honor to serve in this capacity. Um, and just as a reminder, the bylaws. I'm sorry, the delegates created the um, delegate uh, task force almost a year ago to study whether the current system, and this is a quote from the resolution, uh, provided equitable representation to chapters, communities, and members who are not affiliated with either. Um, the task force studied the issue, had seven meetings, public meetings, um, and then following their recommendations, the board met a couple of times to discuss it, and the board also held two public town halls to get input. Um, our committee, and certainly I as the chair, reviewed all of, of that video, particularly the town halls and the final three-hour meeting where the task force came up with their recommendations. So the board in its um, meeting a little over a month ago uh, tasked our committee, the bylaws committee, coming up with recommendations to implement um, the uh, task force recommendations. Um, additionally, the bylaws committee has been working all this year um, to do some updates to the bylaws to bring them in line with the current um, practices and technology and also what we call a, what's always called housekeeping uh, changes, so fix of errors, cross references and those kinds of things as well. So, um, first of all, I wanna talk a little bit about what the board will need to do today, your procedures um and what that will mean going forward particularly in the next week and then at the convention so the board can vote to amend anything in the report that i sent you um on wednesday that's been posted on the website for more than 72 hours now um make any changes and in fact there are four points i don't want to call them small but they are unrelated to the delegate task force recommendations uh, nothing is small, but they're not as large and complex as that. Uh, and those are four points that I do need board input on today before completing this report to send it to members. I have to say someone has some background noise. I hear microphone issues. Is there someone who can mute it? And by the way, while I make that point. Hazel, Hazel can okay. you mute? Yeah, that, that would be great. Thanks. It's just a little distracting yeah. thing because I have a complicated presentation. Also, by the way, since I broke to make that point, um, I probably will not have much chance to look at chat. So I'll, if, if someone has a direct question for me in chat, um, 
player won't have to call that out to me. So just FYI. Uh, but getting back to what the board will be doing today, the board may vote to amend it. Oh, okay, more sounds. The board may vote to amend or take something out um, today. And also the bylaws committee will go through and make sure we clean up all the numbering. And then that report, anything that you want the delegates to vote on in October will be must be sent to the members that, that cleaned up report. Um, the delegates may vote to amend what you said, provided it does not change the general subject matter, and then vote up or down. And um, forgive me if this is blindingly obvious, I feel a bit like a school mark, but I wanna make sure everyone is at the same level of understanding. The delegates may only make amendments that you forward to them today. So for example, if something is in the report online for this meeting, but this board votes to take it out of what you send to the delegates, they can still discuss it because that report will still be online. They could say, well, the bylaws committee thought this, the board thought that. They can hash it out as long as they like in their meeting, but they may only vote to amend or approve the bylaws that this board votes, uh, forwards to them today. Uh, so that's the first point I have to make about today. Also, as I get into in great detail my report, there are two addenda A and B. Uh, addendum A includes all of our recommendations to implement the task force proposals that this board approved and forwarded to the bylaws committee. Plus those um, amendments that I mentioned earlier that the bylaws committee has been working on. Um, in some cases, they're just clarifications or corrections in the bylaws themselves. Um, and that's amendment A. And um, amendment B retains the delegate system. In other words, should the delegates vote to keep the delegate system, we still want them to be able to consider the other amendments that were brought by the bylaws committee itself. And also there is a little bit of cleaning up, which I'll get into a bit later, of those paragraphs that would be cut in addendum A um, for clarification. Um, couple of notes I wanna make about addendum A and addendum B now, just so we all have the same understanding. Um, first of all, as noted in my report, the final version that's approved of any amendments by the delegates may be different than amendment A and amendment B because the delegates have the right to amend or to take some things out. So the final version, whether it has the delegate system retained or they vote to replace it with online voting may be different than A and B. Uh, second, if the delegates vote to approve Amendment A, there's no need to vote on Amendment B because the only difference would be is that it puts back in some of those paragraphs that would be cut to implement the delegate task force. Um, and I also wanna say a few words about what Addendum B is not. Um, it is not a quote unquote reform of the current system. Um, I think everyone looking at this process would agree. Um, there's two camps with a camp in the middle that's still deciding. Uh, one camp is for the delegate task force and replacing the delegates with um, voting remotely by ballot and making the ballot open to all members in good standing. And the other camp wants to retain the delegate system. Many of those people have said that they do think there should be reforms to the delegate system. Um, I've actually not heard anyone express the idea, you know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? However, I've not heard from everyone. There are people who perhaps did not show up to the town halls who have that opinion. Um, but I don't want people to think that because there are amendments to the delegate, the paragraphs of the delegates, it's been B that we addressed the core question of how delegates are A, allocated, designated, voting. Um, we have not. Those, those amendments are for clarification. Um, there are, however, a few issues with the system that we did identify, which if the delegates vote to keep the system could be looked at in future years. One is um, the principle, which I have mentioned in my report, if everyone here has read it, the principle of one person, one vote. Um, and I wanna be clear, I did not put that in the report because I was suggesting it for this year. First of all, it's much too late in the process this year. Um, the delegates have already been registered, promises have been made. Also, this is how the system is run for, well, I think a few decades, certainly more than 50 years, which is about how long I've been involved. Um, uh, but we have a system now where 
if a chapter is unable to send any delegates, they get no votes to the convention. Uh, but if a chapter is able to send one delegate and they're eligible for three, then that delegate becomes what we call a multi-voter. Um, and that is contrary to the way that that is handled in Robert's Rules, uh, delegates meeting at a convention is specifically addressed differently. Um, however, and, and this is, by the way, not in our bylaws, that's a policy. So it's something that SBJ could even look at between conferences. Uh, however, I want to be very clear, Addendum B does not delve into that. We did discuss it in our meeting, and actually Bob was present in that, in that meeting, and he gave us, you know, graciously gave us some of the history on how that evolved and how it was for the advantage of chapters. Um, now, I want to say just briefly what Addendum B does do. Um, it clarifies some of the language, and here again, we got some help from Bob because the current Article 14 is unclear um, on some points, and I think that did lead to some of the confusion last year. So he said some modifications. These do not change current procedures. They are merely to clarify the current procedures. If they keep the delegate system, they'll have to look at that for other changes. So, and the final thing I want to point I want to make on A and B is that if the board votes to forward both addendum A and addendum B today, the board is not necessarily recommending either. In other words, you're not recommending that they adopt the task force plan um, unless, you know, although you have the right to do that. Um, if you do want to make a recommendation, uh, the delegate, that's one more factor that the delegates can take into consideration, although of course the delegates are going to do whatever they're going to do. Um, so that covers my part of my report, which is basically just outlining what the board needs to do today and what that intentions of that mean going forward. Uh, now there are four items that I mentioned and I wanna just briefly say what they are. We can pick them up later, but these four items, um, the bylaws committee will need guidance on before sending the final, final report to the members this week. Um, and obviously the board can raise questions about things beyond these four items, but this is where we need your input. Um, Alex, can I jump in real quick here? Yes. Do, you wanna, do you wanna share the screen and show them to us? You know, just this way. Um, Online I could, or? yeah. I did ask for that. You um, may be a co-host on this. Okay. Yes, let me do that. Uh, I need to, because I have multiple screens, I need to make certain that I have the right things open on which, so just bear with me for a minute. All right, take your time. I wasn't planning to do this point, but that is a good point to do it. So let me go to bylaws A, and then let me go to the first point, and then I'll share screen. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Take your no, it's, it's an excellent point, because I think it will actually make it easier to follow along. So in the first two um, points we have to make are in the membership article four. So let me get to the right point. We have long bylaws, so it takes some time. All right. I need to go to the pre-edited version. And there we are. Okay. And now let me share screen. Uh, desktop two. There we go. Can everyone see that? No. Oh, wait. No, I need to. Sorry. One more thing I need to click. I'm glad I asked. Now okay. everyone should be able to see that. Okay. Okay. So of the four items that I mentioned where basically we need some input or a decision by the board. Alex, can you blow it up uh, full screen for you? Uh, yeah, let me do that. Is that easier to see? I don't know if that, yeah, is that easier for you to see? Yes. Okay, good, excellent. Okay, so the first of these four items, and I will go through them quickly and you can decide how you wanna. Uh, Take your time. Can Excuse me, Alex, can you just tell us what page in the document for those who can okay. see the document? Well, this is the edited, uh, and see, I had the clean version person in the edited, but I went to the edited. This is edited page 29, addendum A. Although this, I should also mention that all four of these items, because they're unrelated to the delegate fact task force um, recommendations, they are in both addendum A and addendum B. In other words, we're asking delegates to vote on them regardless of how they vote on the core question of the delegates. Um, the first one is uh, associate members. And as you can see from my screen, uh, 
the bylaws committee is recommending um, eliminating this section um, and moving the current associate members into a more flexible program of um, supporters, which does not need to be in the bylaws. Uh, when this was created, and two of the bylaws committee members, I think he's here, Bill, Bill and I were actually on the board when this program was created. The idea was that it would be a supporter program, um, essentially what PBS has, public television, public radio, and that um, currently they donate $20 a year uh, to SPJ. They have really no membership pri privileges. They can't, as you can see from the etched out part there, they can't vote, they can't hold office, uh, they can't be delegates at convention, um, they can't count towards delegate counts. Um, they can't, well, and also they are not supposed to be journalists, they, they say, because then if they're journalists, they should become professional members. Um, and they're really just supporters and currently they, they donate uh, $20 a year. Um, and the idea was it was a supporter program. A couple of us, and, and I think, you know, I was among them, questioned why they were called associate members uh, rather than supporters. It is a bit confusing throughout the bylaws, especially as we're going through to do these amendments for the task force, we had to keep saying uh, that the ballot should be sent to all members in good standing, except for associate members, because they're not really members. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of discussion about just calling us a supporter program. So what the, the task for, I'm sorry, what the bylaws committee is recommending is that we eliminate um, this section. Um, and that we uh, roll the people, and there's about 300 now. So I, I don't want to diss those people. There's about 300 people who, who give $20 a year. So it's it's a small contribution to our overall budget, but they're just saying they want to support SBJ. Uh, we would roll them into a supporter program, which does not need to be mentioned in the bylaws. Um, and it would be like a PBS supporter program. And there'd be a lot more flexibility in that case um, for the board and for headquarters to um, you know, possibly create a tiered supporter program, create other benefits, not a sort of pseudo watered down version of a member where you're not really a member, uh, but perhaps other incentives to, to support SPJ, uh, but leave that flexibility up to the board and the staff to create those. And that would also incidentally, but not incidentally make the bylaws much easier when we get to places like elections um, and online voting, not to have to mention in every case that they're open to all members in good standing except for associates. Um, and I don't know, Rebecca, how do you want to take, do you want- um, I, no, I want to ask you, I want to ask quite, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I want to ask want questions. To take questions and sort of vote on each thing as we go through these four items. That you would be easier. Us? Okay, that would be easier. The but, last I will the last thing I'll then say about this, Rebecca, is because there are about 300 people who are currently, and some of them maybe automatically billing the 20 bucks once a year. It's just a contribution. Um, in other instances, we leave it up to next year's board to rewrite policies. In this instance, we did want a motion from you today saying that. Should the delegates decide to amend the bylaws to remove the associate membership category, those um, individuals currently counted as associates should be rolled into a supporter program. All right, let me uh, jump in on this one. So we're not getting rid of associate members, are we? I mean- But they're supporters. They're supporters. Fact, they were always designed to be supporters. Right. But are we going to call We're them it. <laughs> Alex? Are we calling them supporters or associate members? You see, I think when you have that associate member title, even though I understand the definition here is, is being tweaked, which I, I like what I'm seeing here. When I see that you have an associate member, you still have that, in my opinion, the prestige of being an associate member, not just a supporter, because sometimes I think supporters are like sponsors, right? They don't have a vote. When I'm an associate member, which I see with other journalism organizations, there's a prestige, there's a feeling of belonging and being included. I like the way you have, and your committee, have focused and streamlined this, I do. I still think though, that we still need the name associate member. I, I do like how you, again, tighten things up. Does that make sense to you, what I'm saying here? Uh, no, honestly. Uh, I mean, the bylaws committee has discussed this at length, 
and the associates were designed to be supporters, not to be members of the society. And in fact, in no way are they granted any membership privileges. Um, and by having it in the bylaws, there's no flexibility. And it also means that every time you mention members in good standing, you have to say that excluding associates. So you're essentially going through the bylaws again and again and saying that associates are not members. Got it. Okay. All right. I mean, again, I appreciate that you're explaining all this because it can be rather confusing. Any well, other it's up to the board. I mean, it is yeah. up to the board. If the, I mean, I if the board. Alex, I understand that part. I'm just, I appreciate that you're clarifying, you know, the difference between my thought process and, and what your, your uh, committee looked at. Any other board members, any questions on this? I'm just looking up and down. Claire, do you see anybody wanting to ask a question? All right. No, I'm scrolling through. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Claire. I, I cannot keep track yeah, of that. I'm With all these great documents I've opened. So and if somebody just shout out, please. Yeah, anybody? Okay. So, so I guess that I guess we can entertain a motion to to pass this one. Is this what you want to do one by one? Um, well, these four we did okay. want input. However, this one, if the, if the board decides to go with the bylaws recommendation, I mean, we just thought it would be a good idea to clarify in advance if they'd be rolled into a supporter program. But that is something that SBJ has the right to do without a motion today. In other words, if the bylaws approve of, I mean, if the delegates approve of that bylaw change in convention, the next board will just do that. We'll roll them into a supporter program. I mean, okay. in all of these, it's, it's up to the delegates at the end. So, so are, but again, to ask you, do we have to vote on this? Um, well, no, I, I was looking for guidance, though, from the board, and I don't know if that's something the board, I did put those four items into the report, but I don't know if that's something that the board I, no, I, again, Madam, okay. Madam, Madam, Madam President, point of order. Yes, go ahead. Um, let me just bring this up as parliamentarian because we're talking about two different things here. So we're talking about procedure and we're talking about guidance, right? And so therefore, if the question is how will the board adopt from the report, the question uh, right now that you two are discussing is should we accept in total the report or are we going to do piecemeal? Um, and that seems to be to be a question for the board in general. How do we want to proceed with yeah. the adoption of, hold on, point of order, Madam President. So I'm advising you that maybe the question, rather than have it, leave it to Alex, because Alex is only playing the role of a bylaws chairperson. She's not playing the role of whether or not she's going to designate what we do as a board. Perhaps we should, we should, we should discuss and somebody make a motion to discuss whether or not we're going to accept the whole report as a whole. Because if we accept the whole report as a whole, then Alex would need to give, give us the whole report, discuss the report, and then make a motion to, uh, to accept the report. If we're gonna do it in piecemeal, then that would be a second procedure. So my advice to you is let's first address what, what does the board want? Um, and so somebody would need to make a motion and then we just we, we put that question on the table and then we discuss. And um, uh, let me ask you this, Israel. So if we make a motion, do we make the motion to discuss it as a whole or to discuss it in parts? That's what that would somebody would have to make a motion to say, I move that, you know, I, I make a motion to and it's either going to be to accept it in total or accept it piecemeal. And then we discuss the merits of that. But we need to at least establish that procedure first. Because what Alex is asking is, well, I need guidance. Well, that's that's not our role right now to give you guidance. We need to either accept it. Once it's accepted, then the bylaws has the next few days to put it before the assembly under the 60-day rule. Thank you so much for that clarification. All right, does someone want to make a motion on this issue, please? I, I do have a uh, question. Yes, Danielle McClure. Um, so, so I'm just like, I'm, I'm looking at chat, I'm looking at the feedback, I'm uh, listening to Alex. So I'm just a little confused. So essentially, what would the impact be on high school um, supporters or associates? What, um, what would that impact be if we were to approve this? 
Alex? Do you um, have high school members in this? Yeah, I. Not, not that. I mean, if you're asking what's current, I, I don't know what's current. I just want to make one point, um, Israel. I'm not. First of all, I cannot. Obviously, I cannot make a motion because I'm not a board member. Uh, but I am going to say I'm not asking the board to consider every section piecemeal. I identified four sections that we, the bylaws committee, wanted some discussion before we sent this report. And obvious, and I made a lot of comments at the beginning, but I said, obviously, there are any other things you want to break out of this as a board, you know, ask questions, all of that. That's the product of the board. Uh, but these are four things that I need to ask you as the committee chair for input before we send our final report this week. Um, just to be clear, but you can vote to discuss the entire package. I can then mention that I need feedback on these four. Um, but um, Thank you for that clarification. Can you answer Danielle McLean's? Answer? Yeah. Um, right now, the idea with the supporter category, which we called associates, was that it was anyone who was not eligible to be a professional member. So um, it could be a high school student. It could be a person who's um, not a professional member, basically. <laughs> basically. Um, uh, so everyone who is currently an associate would be rolled into the supporter category. And they that would basically just not exist in the bylaws. The, um, there would be a lot more flexibility. I mean, I don't want to second guess what the board could do, future boards. You could make a junior whatever. You could create a whole program around high school students, for example, that only they could do as long as it was part of this supporter program it was not in the bylaws. And it was as long as it's not in the bylaws, it's understood that they do not have full membership privileges and cannot vote in elections, uh, run for office, you know, and do all of the things that professional members can do. Um, so basically, I guess what I'm saying is if we move those out of the bylaws and create a supporter program, there would actually be a lot more flexibility for the board and the staff to come up with programs. And, and this, they could have different programs targeted at different groups. One could be high school students who are interested in journalism. Another could be, um, you know, household. I mean, some of the people who, are, who pay their $20 a year as associates are the spouses of professional members, for example. Um, you'd have that flexibility if it weren't in the bylaws. And also the bylaws would then have the flexibility of not having to mention every time the, the privileges being a member come up like voting, for example, but not associate members. Got it. I think, uh, you know, leaves it um, very open, very open-ended to be honest with you. All right. I so got, I could have got a, a follow-up question to that. Yeah. So, um, I, well, two questions. Um, I know what you just mentioned non-pro, would that include campus, um, chapters as well and uh, oh no that that is a category let me scroll oh, up right. the members yeah yeah no they are definitely members they are a different yes. category right. let me scroll through the membership in the language right professional okay. is uh professional and retired professional journalist right. I, I saw i heard you say non for yeah, institutional members. yeah no and i was speaking shorthand institutional which are like the um chapters and campuses or institutional chapters. So, Students uh, is, student. is a membership category. They have full privileges they, and postgraduate is another that three years after if they're not working in journalism. They have, I wanna make that very clear. They have, they will continue to have full privileges to vote in our elections, to run for office, uh, to serve as delegates should that continue. They would continue to have that. The only category that would change there would be these associates. Um, so um, my one follow up to that is like, I, I understand like the benefits you make it more open. Um, would they lose any privileges? Um, would they lose any like rights since the process? They, they don't really have any rights other than to call themselves an associate member that I'm aware of. And if someone knows of any, correct me, but mm -hmm. it, it basically only says what they can't do. I guess the only thing is they would no longer be called associate members. Um, and I'm, calling it a supporter program, but I mean, this is not something that the bylaws committee has studied or should study. I mean, that really is something left to the board. The board may even want to have a small task force to look at this. You could call it anything as long as it's clear that they're not members. So they would lose the right to call themselves associate members. Bear in mind, they're only paying $20 a year um, because they want to support SPJ. Maybe they have a family, like a 
spouse or son or daughter who's an SPJ member. So, you know, I've heard of that as an example. Um, so I guess you should also argue whether that it should be called associate members um, since they're basically just donating $20 a year. It doesn't have to be supporters. And so maybe we don't need um, uh, a motion today, but if you send, you forward this to the delegates and they vote to make this change, then next year, this is one of the things that the board would need to do. Uh, you'd want to roll those associates into some kind of a supporter program and think about how you're going to rebrand that. Uh, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Danielle that, McLean, any more? Uh, that answers it. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Madam and President, one more point of order. Yes. Um, ahead, so, um, so to the question uh, of my colleague who, who just asked the last few questions, um, uh, again, I want to I want to raise the issue that my colleague who just raised the last series of questions was asking about the substance of one of three sections of the bylaws mm -hmm. committee proposals, and 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 again, it's very important questions. But still, the issue is how are we going to proceed in this mm -hmm. meeting? with regards to, to, to this report. May I recommend to you, and then again, you can decide if this is what you want to adopt. The report is, is done in three sections. The report has section one, proposals to implement the task force recommendation, section two, proposals by the committee unrelated to the task force recommendation, and then section three, proposals by the committee to amend sections by the bylaws that will be struck if the task force recommendations have been adopted. I would advise you, that perhaps maybe we follow the bylaws committee report. And so that section one is addressed and then the, the board would vote on that. Then the, 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 the chairwoman from the bylaws could then talk about section two and then the board would then vote on that. So that way it's not convoluted. And I certainly don't want those attending to be going back and forth between a 50 page document. So my recommendation to you would be perhaps follow what the report says and break it up into three presentations, each presentation by itself, discuss, debated and voted on. Yes, and Israel, you brought that up before because that's why you said, you know, let's put a motion whether we're gonna discuss them all at one time or, or just, you know, make a motion that we're gonna take each section, right? And so we still need a motion to do that, right? That's correct. And, and again, I'm, I'm serving as parliamentarian, so I want to at least serve in my in that role as much as possible. So I would advise you, and I'm because I can only address you, Madam President, that you then advise the rest of the board members if they'd like to take the recommendations that you are adopting from the parliamentarian chair. So board, I do recommend, you know, because instead of pulling all together and in the end, we're trying to figure out what is what, I think we take each section and, and then look at it vote on it and then move on to the next section this way we're not spending all the, at the end you know we'll be asking about one section over the other section you know it to me it's more understandable and i think it'll make this meeting flow a little easier so i still need a motion to discuss uh, these issues in parts so and and, and that's correct in, in in that way right um israel i would recommend to you that the call the question as you have just made it which is make a put the question on the floor. If there's going to be a motion, it's a motion to adopt the sections that are from the report and for there to be a discussion based on the three sections individually, uh, uh, discussed one at a time, and then voted on one at a time. But the members have to make a motion and has to be seconded. And that that hasn't. You can you can certainly uh, right. ask the boards to do that, but then somebody has to make that motion. And I see that uh, yeah. the, Raphael has from his hand up. Has that? And Raphael has. Go ahead. Um, okay, two things uh, real quick. I just wanted to make sure that we were aware of the conversation going on in chat. We don't call them associate members now. They're only called associates. I just wanted to make sure that that's at the forefront as we are uh, continuing that conversation. I would like to move that we, the board, forward, I think it's called Addendum A, uh, to the delegates for consideration at the conference. Is that the proper wording, uh, Israel? Well, if you're if you're talking about addendum A, um, then certainly, then what if if I understand correctly, uh, my friend from Florida, what he's discussing is we're going to be adopting addenda A, and we're going to vote on that, and then addenda B, and then vote on that. But then we've got the three sections that the report is broken into, 
So are you, are, is, is your motion that you're just for right now, you're just talking about addenda A, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so the question, so so uh, the, the gentleman from Florida has um, made a motion. Is there a second? I second, you bet. Okay, so, the, so now the question is on the floor to be discussed and debated on whether or not the board will accept addenda A to be sent to the floor of the convention. All right. Who would like to discuss? So now it's a discussion. That's good correct. Discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Rafael. And I'm, thank scro you. I'm scrolling, Rebecca. I'm looking. Mm -hmm. But for the board. Um, yeah. For the board. Anybody else? Danielle McLean, any more questions? Uh, you have some very good ones always. Emily? Um, Danielle, I'm good. Danielle took the questions out of my mouth. Okay, Emily. <laughs> thank you for making it shorter. I thought so this was we'll a very good question. Um, so this is just like the um, housekeeping ones, and we'll address the um, addendum B after this, right? Yes. Okay. Anybody? Any discussion? Claire? <laughs> I don't want to call you guys out. You know, I mean, if you don't have any discussion on this, um, anybody? I mean, I, I'm going to support addendum A, the uh, recommend sending them to the floor. Um, I don't see any really to like any red flags with this and yeah. I think um, it should just really um, let the membership decide on this front so yeah um, and let it get ironed out during the convention so I agree with you I think that uh, this committee has put forth something that obviously we can all have input on but right now I feel comfortable with it um, anybody else so Israel do we take a vote on this now you can close the question and take up a take up take up a vote so I, um, anybody else? I just want to make sure. Uh, Claire, you see any board members? No. Sorry, I'm not scrolling up and down. Yeah, I am. All right. So can we just take a vote by everybody says I or nay? Yes? I, I think it would be best in this situation to get a roll call. All right. Uh, Yvette, uh, Yvette, you're on the train, so I'll let Claire do it. Um, mm -hmm. Claire, you want to take a roll on this one? Yes. Uh, we're voting on uh, the... Let me get the language right because I know somebody will call me out on this. Uh, Israel, get me the language on it this is, one. You, the, the board is voting on whether to uh, adopt uh, Addenda A and send the question to the floor of the convention. Hold on. Roll call, please. Yes. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. President Rebecca Aguilar? Um, yes. Claire Regan, yes. Yvette de Villa Richards, I believe she's not. Oh, there she is. Yvette. I'd say, I'd say yes. Okay, thank you. Israel Balderas. Uh, Israel abstains due to his role today as a parliamentarian. Okay. Emily Block. Yes. Daniela Ibarra. Yes. Danielle McLean. Yes. Rafael Almeida. Yes. Carol Smith. Yes. Thank you all. All right, so the motion passes with eight yes, one abstention. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, um, so what I think I'll do, I had um, I done my outline where I would just say a small amount, like I'd only plan to say a few sentences and take questions later, although of course the board can ask questions whenever they want. Um, about these four items that are unrelated, but they are in both addenda A and B, and then get to um, what I think is the main event everyone is waiting for, which is speaking about the proposals to implement the task force, which is addenda A. So associate members, I, I believe we've covered. Um, just wanna briefly make um, three further points. Fellows, um, last year they took out a sentence saying, um, from the bylaws, there was an amendment saying that fellows would pay dues after the first year I'd actually always, I think many people thought this was an honorary lifetime membership, but it was um, voted, or maybe this was two years ago, it was voted in Patty's year. Um, so it's a bit unclear the way it's worded now. And um, also this sentence in section eight, you can still see the shared screen is very unclear with this long list of types of categories of membership, also does not mention lifetime members. For the record, I'm a lifetime member. I know several of you on the call are. All that means is you're a professional member who paid in advance many years ago. 
Um, so the bylaws committee is recommending this change, uh, making it, you know, just clarifying that fellows enjoy all the rights and privileges of membership in section eight below. And then um, clarifying that to remain in good standing, all members other than fellows and lifetime members must pay current national mm -hmm. dues to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, to remain in good standing. Now, Bob, who was in our, um, you know, final um, drafting meeting, and who also submitted many changes and comments both before and after that meeting, said that this had been left deliberately vague when it was modified a few years ago, um, so that if a future board wanted to start charging fellows, um, they could. I think that would also raise the question, though, with the people who've been made fellows in the period in between, should they still be honorary members? Um, our committee unanimously uh, supported this language here. But I did ask John for, oh, let me see if I can find it now. I think, hold on. I think my, yes, my toolbar has moved to the second screen. Sorry. Here we go. Anyway, this is the language from when it was um, passed a, few, a couple of years ago in February 2020 to make them fellows. That's my highlighting of it. And the only motion was to make them lifetime members of SPJ um, upon acceptance of being fellows. And uh, it passed unanimously. So it, essentially, I'm asking you to support the language that was um, unanimously supported by the task force there. I mean, by the, um, I'm sorry, by my bylaws committee. Uh, OK, so the third part, and this is where um, the, I can close that down now. So you can read this. This is where the board forwarded the committee a request to specify the bylaws, bylaws that the board is the final interpreter of the bylaws. This was actually a recommendation that came from the task force, but was um, unrelated to the original purpose of the task force. Um, my understanding is that your board asked us for very specific language here. Uh, we recommend against making it specific language. We recommend simply saying, making it clear that Robert's rules applies to all board meetings and actions of the board. Robert's rules has a section which is very clear on interpretation of the bylaws. Um, but I don't think this is anything that they would ever want to do without the bylaws committee being present. And there could actually be problems with putting that in the bylaws. We looked at other similar organizations in the HJ and Saja and ONA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so basically, it's perhaps not as explicit as you asked for, but that's what we found um, looking into Robert's Rules and um, other similar organizations' bylaws. And finally, I just want to point out there's a question in there about um, the article on headquarters. Let me find that. One, and this was very late in the process. One of our committee members said, is it still necessary to specify that there has to be a physical headquarters? Given that SBJ has sold this building, we have small rented offices. We're not really certain only the board and the staff would have a sense of how often those are used. Um, however, I wanna say we did not have time to research this question or, or to, I mean, we certainly don't have a recommendation one way or the other on this question. Um, and I'm still scrolling down. Now, the thing is, should you eliminate it, which is I'm showing you here what that would look like, it's one sentence. It says, a national headquarters office shall be maintained at a location to be designated by the board of directors. So it's pretty clear it has to be a physical location. Um, and we had some questions about that. The board might decide to close this office in the future. Perhaps it's not getting any use at all and they decide to go virtual. Perhaps they hire an executive director in a different city, for example. Um, there, there are two schools of thought here, which I think are equally valid. One is that um, there is a validity to giving flexibility to the board in future uh, to manage as they see is, is best. On the other hand, it may be that closing the physical office, even if it's a small rented office that doesn't get much use, is um, you know a step that the board should have to do a bylaw as amendments for. If you remove this, the board can still maintain a physical office um, or not, it would be their choice. If you leave this in or basically 
forward it to the de um, delegates with this um, article still in. Um, then in the future, if, if the board wanted to make that change, they'd have to go through the year long, you know, uh, amendment process. So those are the points, the four points that I wanted to um, draw your attention to before we get on to the major revision to implement the delegate task force plan. And um, as I was putting together my notes, I was sort of joking um, that this is, I feel like those were the warm up bands and now we're getting to the main act. Um, so, so let's address these right now. Uh, okay, so you do wanna address these before we get to the yes, task force. Right? Okay, so let me these, scroll to membership. I, I have a question. Yeah, okay. um, Danielle, give me a minute, please. Sure. Um, and, you know, I want all you guys to ask questions. Um, real quick on the headquarters, I'm glad you caught that because this is a different time, you know, and, and this is something that I'm going to uh, talk with Erwin about because, you know, when we look for the next executive director, you know, for example, IRE, you know, they used to have an office, but their executive director lives in San Antonio. Uh, a lot of these executive directors now live in different parts of the country because the pandemic has shown us that we can get the job done anywhere in the country. So I'm glad you looked at that. It may be a small detail. I mean, sure, if anybody wants to headquarter in Indianapolis, but this is something that I want to discuss with Irwin because, you know, we need to be flexible. This is a different time than, you know, when SPJ started back in the, the day. Uh, but Danielle, uh, go ahead. Um, well, I, I, I do got a question about the headquarters. Um, so what, what are we going to be listing as our headquarters for tax purposes and, um, um, you know, just general, like, do, like, I assume for tax purposes going forward, now that the building's sold, we would need to change our headquarters location. And wouldn't that be just like the de facto headquarters, even if nobody's really even occupying it? Well, we still have, you know, we have still have rented space, so we're going to definitely honor that lease. Yeah. Uh, but this is some kind of guidance that I always turn to for the attorney, um, uh, just because I think Mark Balin has been a really good guide in that area. I wish I could tell you an answer on that. There'll always I can. Be... Oh, you can, John. Thank you so much. Well, we have a PO box, and that's going to be our what we'll use um, at the for the time and probably for in perpetuity as long as staff is mainly headquartered in Indianapolis and then we have a physical address that we use for some vendors and things like that but so so, so that would be like that would be considered our national headquarters whatever that address is, is that right the IRS is aware of the PO box address okay thank you and, John uh, for that so information like losing the national headquarters this one like really kind of change anything with like I don't know if this necessarily needs to be changed if we're still maintaining well, no, it, that address yeah. like as actual headquarters yeah I mean and, and as you may remember our organization is headquartered in Indianapolis, but it's incorporated in Illinois. So um, yeah, but uh, that's excellent question. Uh, and thank you, John, for filling us in on that uh, part of it. Any other questions from any other board members? And Danielle, if you have any follow-ups, feel free. Anybody? Claire, do you see anybody? No. Okay. I'm scrolling. Okay. Don't wanna make this a seven hour board meeting. All right, so um, I'm turning to my parliamentarian. So do we vote on, you know, on this, this group of, um, of, of amendments or? You could, you could do it again, same, same advice, right? You could do it uh, piecemeal uh, by each section. And then a, a board member would make a motion that he, she, they would want to uh, vote by piecemeal. You'd have to have a second. You could discuss that, or um, certainly a, a board member can make a motion. Let's uh, 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 accept uh, recommendations. Total, yeah, so accept in total all four recommendations that uh, the uh, chairwoman from the bylaws committee has made, and then you'd all have a discussion on all four that she just discussed. Thank you for your guidance. Right. Point of clarification, Madam President. I made three recommendations on the first three items. We did not make a recommendation on national headquarters specifically because A, we haven't really discussed it as a committee and B, we don't have enough information. We don't know things such as how, how much, how often the office is being used, whether SPJ is considering hiring an executive director who's based elsewhere than India. We don't have the information to, to make a recommendation. So we have recommendations on items one, two, and three that I put out there and item four, we were putting out there for the basically the board to decide, but we make no recommendation on either way on, on the, the fourth item, headquarters. 
Yeah, Thanks, I, I, I like to request that we don't consider the national changes to the national headquarters check section for this. Well, as she said, it wasn't a recommendation, so oh, okay. we're not going to go on that anyway. There's um, nothing on the floor yet. There's nothing on the floor yet, so we don't have to worry about this. Just when when somebody makes the motion, just leave that out. That's correct. All right. Who would like to make that motion? Israel, does this motion send it to the delegates, or is this something that we're doing? I, so, I'm, I'm a little confused on the uh, right now. Right now, it's just somebody needs to make a motion. Whether what procedure you're going to take for these recommendations? So, do you make a motion to accept um, all, or are you going to discuss each one? Uh, and it seems like the the chairwoman from the bylaws committee has made a point of clarification. So, the motion would be to discuss everything that she just presented, uh, debate, and vote on that. So does anybody want to make a motion to accept them all? Or we could do the other one and go through them, but who wants to make a motion? Any board member, please. I'll move that we uh, adopt the first three, uh, the three recommendations that were made by the bylaws community. I'll second that. In this, section, in this section. The question Thank is you. now on the floor. The question, discussion. discussion? Point of clarification, this would not um, include the major debatable changes. Just want to clarify that that would not like the um, one member, one vote kind of. We're, we're okay. right now, we're not moving. We're not discussing that. That's not that's yeah. not what has been presented, nor okay. is that something that has been discussed. Uh, as the chairwoman from the bylaws committee said, she's moving towards that presentation. This is just the preliminary discussion of, of, of other issues. So. Okay. We're not there yet. And Alex, if, it, Alex, if you don't mind, can can we just uh, in one sentence each the the three right. items we're talking about here are right. And uh, there's another clarification I want to have with you. So associate members, removing that um, section, it's a section within the membership article from the bylaws, um, and rolling them into a supporter program that's more flexible to be defined by the board the staff. Number one. Number two, clarifying that fellows are a lifetime membership and they have the same <laughs> as prof other professional members um, without paying dues. Um, number three, um, making the um, instead of explicitly making the board the interpreter of bylaws, referring in the board of directors section to Robert's rules and saying that that applies there. And I want to be clear, and I'm going to make this change now just so you can read this more easily. So with number four, we put that in there for discussion without a recommendation. So, um, hold on. Why and you made that very clear. We know it's not a recommendation. Yeah, so this one here, Article 11 would be retained. You would not be forwarding that change to the delegates. The delegates could yeah. always discuss it, but they would not be able to vote on it. We would put this article back in and what we send to the members this week. Thank you. Any more discussion on this issue or does someone do want to uh, make a motion to accept them all? We just so there's, there's a question. The question is on, <laughs> Sorry. on the right now. Any anything else on this? I, I would just request that I just request that my fellow board members check in the chat because there's a, a decent point being made that uh, item number two reverses a decision made two years ago by the board. I was not on that board, so I'm not sure what's being referred to there. But uh, but Madam I, I'm not somebody who can clarify that. Madam President, can I can I speak to that? Because I I did try to speak to that earlier. Alex, but, please uh, do. Thank okay, you. I have to, because this is- Thank you, happen. Alex. Okay, yes. And this is what I was speaking to here. Um, Bob, I, I'm not following the chat. I know Bob had made this point earlier. I don't know if he made it in the chat. Sorry, um, in the chat. Yes, he did. Two years ago, February, 2020, these are the minutes that I looked up. Um, in the February, 2020 meeting, the board voted to make the fellows lifetime members of SPJ. And you can see, I've hot, this is my highlight here, so you can see that. Um, and the vote was unanimous, and that was part of the acceptance of becoming a fellow. However, and um, okay, I will go back to that section of the bylaws now. Um, and all our committee recommends is clarifying that and also making it easier to understand. So many of the problems that SPJ I think come about from confusion in the bylaws or wherever, saying fellows enjoy all the rights and privileges of membership as defined in section eight below. And then in section eight, instead of this long, long list, which can be confusing, professional, retired professional, institutional, student, postgraduate categories, 
It just says to remain in good standing, all members other than fellows and lifetime members must pay current national dues, blah, 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 to remain in good standing. And lifetime members are those who like me and some other people on this call basically paid a large lump sum some years ago. Um, Okay. Bob made the point, no, let me finish. So Bob's point, and I haven't read the chat, was that in that meeting, they decided to leave it basically a, a strategic ambiguity in the bylaws so that if a future board wanted to rescind the lifetime membership, in other words, take away the lifetime membership from fellows, they could do that without having to make a bylaws change. I mean, there are a number of questions I think that that sparks such as, what happens to the fellows who were named as lifetime members? Are they suddenly sent a bill? Um, but more importantly, I don't see that in the motion that was passed. It mm -hmm. may very well, because I wasn't in that meeting, it may very well have been discussed. Oh, let's just leave it vague in the bylaws. So but my bylaws committee feels that it is not a good thing to have deliberate ambiguity in bylaws. So this would just clarify that. The last point I'll say about overriding a board two years ago, the same board can rescind a policy that it voted on in the previous meeting. It, 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 a board vote always takes precedent over something that was a former board, board vote, something that's not in the bylaws. So even if that had been in the motion that we want to leave it deliberately vague in the bylaws, this board can decide that they want to clarify it in the bylaws, and that's perfectly fine. All right. Alex, thank you so much. Uh, since you did mention Bob Becker, Bob, um, I'd like you to take the floor, please add what you have to say. Let's keep it brief. Again, I don't want to have a long meeting, but Bob, since your name was mentioned in this, please, you know, uh, feel free okay. to explain your point. Okay. Uh, just for context. Bob, do me a product, favor. Take your time yeah. because this okay. is a lot of information. Okay. Just for context, at the time that the board took that vote, the bylaws said that SPJ would pay one year of dues for each fellow who was not already an SPJ member. For several years prior to that, the board had in fact been giving fellows lifetime memberships, despite what the bylaws said. Mm -hmm. So the vote was to for the board in 2018 or 2019, whenever that was, was to simply ratify what the practice had been for several years. And at the same time, they said, okay, we have to remove from the bylaws the statement that we're only paying one year dues because our practice is something different. Mm -hmm. And so at the result of that was to say, this is what we're doing. This is what we plan to do. We're gonna take out the conflicting language from the bylaws. And as a result, the board in a future period can say, we're no longer gonna do that. But that doesn't change the status of, Pat, of, of fellows who are already uh, lifetime members because they are lifetime members. They have the same privilege as every other member for the rest of their life, mm -hmm. which is as much as the bylaws ever say about lifetime members. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what you would be doing if you start putting this back in is simply the, the net effect is to reverse what, what the board did two years ago or three years ago to fix the problem. Madam President. Excuse me, hold, hold, hold on, Alex. Um, I have a, so Bob, in this situation, I just wanna talk to Bob for just one second here. So in your opinion, um, are you saying this is adding more confusion to the, what was there before or elaborate on that for me? I think, I think it's, it's, hey, it's unnecessary because a lifetime member is a lifetime member. Uh, regardless of whether it's a fellow or somebody paid the thousand dollars to become a lifetime member. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's unnecessary. Um, and it would allow the board in the future to say, okay, we're no longer doing that. It doesn't affect the people in the past, but it does, if going forward, the board says, we don't want to do that anymore. The board does that. Um, so I don't think it's necessary. I think it will it, it, will it cause confusion? I think it just adds more pieces to the bylaws um, and doesn't accomplish anything really. Hmm. Thank you for your opinion. Appreciate that. Alex? 
Yeah, I mean, first, I just want people to look at the text on the screen. We have one sentence here that we've added as just a point of clarification mm -hmm. that fellows enjoy all the rights and privileges of membership, which, as Bob said, and as the minutes that I showed you from the meeting in February 2020 made clear, that was voted on the board. It had been practiced for a long time. I'd always thought that they were honor, um, they were honorary lifetime members. Um, so that's what people believed it was. It was voted on and enshrined um, in the bylaws in 2020. All they did, however, was take out a sentence that contradicted that. However, the next sentence, this part that is um, crossed out in red is what's in the current bylaws. Members of the professional and retired professional institutional student and postgraduate categories must pay current national dues. Okay, this creates two points of confusion. First of all, lifetime members, um, those who paid, like myself and others on this call in advance, are professional members. And fellows who are made lifetime members are professional members. The way that it's worded now actually creates confusion as in it is in error. Members in the professional retired, professional institutional student and postgraduate categories must pay current national dues to hold membership. That's untrue. Fellows and lifetime members do not pay current national dues. So what is actually in the bylaws now is an error. And the last thing I'll say is that my, uh, first of all, this change was proposed by someone, a member of my committee, who's been a member of the bylaws committee for many, many, many years. He proposed the sentence saying fellows enjoy rights and privileges of membership in section eight, and he proposed making this change and eliminating this long, confusing, and in fact, untrue sentence and replacing it with something that's clearer and more accurate. Um, so that was a unanimous recommendation by my committee. And, and finally, I, I don't understand Bob's objection. There's nothing in um, the minutes from that meeting in February 2020 saying that they wanted to leave it deliberately vague so that if a future board wanted to start charging fellows membership. I don't see that in the minutes. It may have been part of the okay. ongoing pre-board discussion, but it's not there. All right, so let me jump in real well, quick. Uh, finally, Rebecca, there's one more point. This board can override any board, any meeting, even something that you yourselves voted on in the last meeting. So it's not a conflict because it was only something that may have been discussed in a board meeting. It, it does not go against anything in the bylaws. Yes, I understand that, definitely. First of all, I appreciate Bob's input on this because, again, you know, yeah, I was on that board two years ago. It's all a blur. Um, but it's always good to look at that. And, and it's interesting how he perceives it and then how you perceive it. What I do look in this language and as journalists, I like things to make crystal clear. Again, some of this amendment stuff can be just like a foreign language. And believe me, I do know a foreign language. And so what I appreciate about what you put forth here, Alex and your committee, is that you made it crystal clear. There is that members in the professional retirement, it's just a lot of like, it's so wordy that I can see the confusion. That line above, fellows enjoy all the rights and privileges of membership, that is crystal clear and I like that. Um, I think I personally like and, and taking into consideration Bob's, you know, um, educating us on the past. Um, I like that this is, again, it's about streamlining, it's about focusing, it's about making the language easier for someone that doesn't even understand when you look at the bylaws. I, I, I for one, um, like the, the changes that you have proposed. It does make it you know, tighter, it makes it more clear. Um, so that's my, my take on this. Um, and again, looking at what Bob had to say, I mean, interesting points of view. Um, on, on that, and it, it was important to to bring him in to have his say because again, he was back. He was a bylaws committee chair back in the day, back then. Um, anybody else? Any other discussion? I mean, to me, I think the original language that was passed two years ago is a little bit more clear. Just reading this as like an editor, but um, uh, really, uh, yeah, I. But I, yeah, it, it does to me. But like. Um, I'm okay to support it because just because the bylaws committee went through the changes and have this get ironed out on the um, on the floor. So I mean, yeah, I think uh, uh, Danielle. I think a, a lot of weight that when I heard Alex, it was one of the four. This is a committee member that had been in the committee for a while. So it's not like it was a new person that said, "Oh, well, let's do this." It was somebody that has I, I assume or that 
he was on the committee before you became the chair, correct? Uh -huh. That's right. And so, you know, this person was there when this all happened I, I, two years ago. And, and for this person to, to look at this language, to tighten it up, to make it clear, I, uh, that's where I put a lot of weight on. Not that I'm not listening to the, the, the chair of this committee, but that someone who was there in the past thought, you know what, we need to clarify this. Um, so that's why I, that's the key point that I heard in this discussion, um, yeah. out of respect for that person that has sat on the committee for, I, you know, I'm thinking a while. Anybody that's, else? That's fair. That's why I'm willing to support it. I just looking at this from some outside, you know, from an outside perspective. Just yeah. Well, there's someone that, uh, you know, again, the bylaws is like reading another language. I, to me, it's just simple. And sometimes we get too wordy at SPJ. I don't know why. I like things tight. Um, but then, you know, I come from broadcasting where we keep our writing very tight. Um, anybody else? Anybody else? Claire, do you see anybody? No. All um, right. Daniela, oh, okay. Ibarra. Daniela Ibarra has her hand up. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I'm, I like the clarification. I read it both ways. And I think it's just, like you said, crystal clear, the way that the new change is proposed. Thank you for your input. Anybody else? All right. So... I think that, um, again, I, I address my parliamentarian here. So again, we put a motion to. Yes, you can, you can, you can close debate and then you can move to uh, make a vote. Uh, again, for reminder, we are voting on all the recommendations made by the chair of the bylaws committee in her second presentation. And you are voting to accept all recommendations in total. I wish I would have taken shorthand. Okay. Oh, back in well, the, the motion's on the the motion is on the floor already. That's so. Correct. The motion is on the floor, so we just correct. We, that's we, correct. We're going to close uh, the debate, um, and so we we can take a vote. So we can just go straight to the vote, right, Rafael? That's correct. Uh, yes, and, and, that's yes. correct. And then just that's and, real. and my recommendation my recommendation is that you take again um, roll, call. roll call. Thank you, both of you. Thank you for your guidance, Claire. Can you call yep. the roll? This one? We're ready. Okay. Uh, President Rebecca Aguilar? Yes. Claire Regan? Yes. Aveta Villa Richards? I say yes. Israel Balderas? Uh, Israel abstains due to his role as parliamentarian in this uh, board meeting today, in this special board meeting today. Okay. Emily Block? Yes. Daniela Ibarra? Yes. Danielle McLean? Yes. Rafael Almeida? Yes. Cheryl Smith? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion passes uh, with eight votes yes and one abstention. All right. Back to you, um, Alex. Moving along. Um, so those, those four points with the warm up bands, um, this is the main act. We'll get into um, what I think everyone, whatever their opinion here would agree, is a major revision um uh proposals to the bylaws to implement the delegate task force plan to um replace the current delegate system with online voting um now first of all i i'll just briefly show you i know you've had this but there's a lot of reading um there are a few word changes essentially in the membership and the section on chapters and communities, which I think are pretty self-explanatory. Um, well, a little bit of it's copying like that. Mostly it's just cutting references to delegates. Uh, for example, you know, how many delegates or who can count towards delegates. I mean, that is pretty self-explanatory. Um, yeah, we're by a majority of other delegates of the national convention. So that's really, Pretty clear, I think, and you've all had a chance to do those. And let the me first, jump in real quick, Alex. Yeah. Board members, I hope you looked at it. This you you've had it, you know, at least, oh, you know, a few days. I hope you looked at all this language. Uh, I mean, I, I appreciate Alex that you're going through this because we have members who are here, and uh, so again, um, yeah, thank you again for. I'm looking at all that going, all that red I'm and blue. Just, yeah, we're not going to go through. I mean, things like for the purposes of apportioning delegates each year to the National Convention, obviously, to implement the Delegate Task Force Plan, that those changes will come out. And there'll be a little bit of renumbering in some cases. Um, 
few things are just, you know, our clarification, just clearing up the language you know, there. Um, okay, in, in the board of directors, we do make it specific here that the board of directors can um, advance these to the membership and they'll be ratified by the membership. For example, this is really just moving stuff around. The first, um, and these are just clarifications, regional coordinator, Ms. Dun Sheehy. The first section where there's a real change is the convention. Okay, things like, again, we change the election will be at the convention to during the convention because in fact the voting is taking place online. Just point of clarification there. Um, also clarifying the ballot shall include referendums for resolutions and amendments to these bylaws, you know, that that will be on the ballot. Um, are we at the convention yet? Yeah, we mentioned we have a rebranding here of the business meeting to the general membership meeting. So we have that in all places where the meeting is mentioned. The first place um, where you see any real changes, um, really it's the convention, the resolutions and the bylaws. I want to start with the convention because um, this is important. The current, um, and you can see we're, we have to cut a lot of the current. The current article uh, 10 on the convention is primarily concerned with allocating um, delegates to chapters and regions. So there is a lot of language that would have to be cut here um, about the allocation of delegates. Um, and basically just everything relating to the allocation of delegates and quorum at the meeting. Obviously, no more delegate meeting, that language comes out. However, we didn't feel that we should just eliminate this section because there still will be a convention, there will still be many meetings, but without the delegate presence, um, we wanted something to confirm that there would still be an opening and closing meeting. So, and also that the members have the sole authority to ratify um, resolutions and bylaws amendments the, the way that the delegates do now. So we have, um, first of all, made that explicitly the new section one, the membership shall have sole authority to ratify any proposals on the ballot for resolutions or bylaws amendments in referendums that should be held during the convention um, or in a year without a convention that should be held during the annual election. In other words, this happens during the convention, but it's open to all members who may be voting from home or not from the convention at least. Um, the same language, we've kept the same language about the convention being by uh, occurring at least the biennially um, and the time and place is designated by the board of directors. Actually, the current um, convention article does not get into a lot of detail on the opening and closing business meetings other than defining the quorum. Um, we've changed the opening and closing business meetings to general membership meetings because now, should the delegates approve this plan, every member who's present at the convention will be able to attend these general membership meetings so long as they are an SPJ member in good standing and they'll all have an equal say in terms of speaking, you know, on, on the issues at hand. Um, and we, so we specified that there will be general membership meetings to mark the opening and closing of the convention, open to all society members in good standing, and um, they'll, they'll be conducted according to the rules established by the board. And that these meetings will include discussion of any proposed resolutions or bylaws and amendments, which must be submitted in advance, because of course now they're going on to a ballot. Um, and one other thing, there are many other meetings that happen at the conventions, um, historically between the opening and closing delegate meetings. Um, we don't want to mandate anything because norms may change in the future, having, you know, for example, regional meetings, committee meetings, et cetera, with one exception, because we've typically had some kind of a meeting for the leaders of um, chapters, um, chapters and communities, and the purpose of this has been to, um, well, we start this a little bit with the program that used to be called Scripps, it is now called Future Leaders Academy, sort of um, the professional development of our local leaders. But we need to really continue this at each convention and also there may be important information we have to give them. However, in the current system, the delegates are primarily all of the chapter leaders at the meeting. 
with a general membership meeting, we have to consider that four out of 10 of the people there might not be affiliated with the chapter or community because 41% um, roughly of our membership are unaffiliated. So we might emphasize chapter um, and community management less at those opening and closing meetings because we don't wanna be leaving four out of 10 people out of the conversation or just losing their attention. So we did wanna say that there'll be three meetings, the opening and closing membership meetings and some sort of meeting between there aimed at um, our SPJ leaders of chapters and communities. And all other meetings are not mandated in the, in the um, bylaws currently and there's no reason to include them in the future. So, so that's the convention. Now there is a new article on resolutions and the reason for that is um, that currently the, the delegates do that. I mean, the resolutions are brought to them. I actually think I want to start with, um, because the meat of the proposal is the bylaws, potential change to the code of ethics and resolutions. There are three different processes. And the most difficult thing my committee had to do was look at these three processes that the delegates deal with presently and have dealt with for many years. They originate differently and they have different objectives. And we tried to come up with sort of a Goldilocks formula for each um, to balance making it easy enough for them to get their resolutions or bylaws amendments on the ballot that's sent to members, but not so easy that we have people joining SBJ just to get something on the ballot, for example. So I think um, because the bylaws amendments are all obviously important and that's the most difficult, I will actually start with bylaws and then proceed to the code of ethics, which we based effectively on bylaws. Um, and then resolutions last. Okay, so, um, and actually it might be easy, since this is an entirely new section except for the last sentence, I'm gonna go up to the clean version because it's easier to read. Uh, with it, and there's no reason to see the markup because it's all new. And that is round 22. Okay. Ah. Okay. So the first thing is origination of bylaws and amendments. Currently, this is not actually specified in the bylaws. Um, they can either come from the bylaws committee who might get a suggestion from anyone, the board or a member, um, and they decide they need to draft a bylaws amendment, or it might come from the board itself as it did this year. You had a task force, um, which was created actually by a resolution, and then you forwarded that to the bylaws committee. We had an obligation to, to draft these bylaws. Um, but this has never been, necessarily originated in a public meeting. Um, so sometimes I remember in the past when I was a, a chapter delegate, I would show up at the convention and I wouldn't know where these bylaws had come from. All of a sudden we were asked to read and vote on complicated amendments that we didn't, didn't know about even though they've been sort of percolating for many months. So one objective of this was to try and pull out the process and provide more points of contact or communication where um, both chapter and community leaders and even members who will be now be voting on the final ratification can hear about and participate in the conversation. So in this case, should the delegates approve these amendments, the origination would have to occur at a public um, board meeting, which would have to be done at least 200 days, which is roughly in the middle um, between conventions, that's about six and a half months, so roughly between one convention and the next convention. Um, obviously, it can be done sooner, that's a deadline. Anyone with an idea can contact the bylaws committee before that date. Um, any, any member of good standing, I should say. Just if I say anyone, assume I mean any SBJ member in good standing. Um, and the bylaws committee chair or their designate needs to be present at that public meeting, and anyone may make a suggestion. Um, the board does not need to vote on this point. This is simply the origination. The bylaws committee will start to draft language on amendments um, that do not conflict, obviously, with laws or our code of ethics or, or anything like that. And um, the crucial thing is before they bring it to the board for a vote in a meeting like we have today, um, they have to put all of this language out to a minimum 60-day public comment period open to all members in good standing. And, um, we are recommending that if this is passed, that the new board draft a policy for that public comment period. It will probably include something like the town halls that we saw recently, 
Um, and people, again, members in good standing could come to these and make comments, suggestions for amendments, et cetera. Um, and the bylaws committee can actually make changes to the language after these, these comments. Um, and that basically is the new iteration of the amendments that the delegates can propose currently in the delegate meeting with the difference that in the current system, only the delegates can propose this and they only get voted on during um, that brief meeting. Whereas in this case, there's a 60 day comment period and hopefully there are several points of contact with the members in that comment period. Um, at that point, uh, the bylaws committee needs to take it to the board for referral to the ballot. Um, and this is also done in a public meeting like we're having today. Um, obviously the bylaws chair has to be present, but we put that in. A key point here is that we've asked that at least five board members vote in favor of advancing a proposal. In other words, we don't make it a majority of the board members voting. We make it a majority of the board, regardless of who's there that day or who abstains. And the reason for this is we heard people on both sides of the issue. Some people didn't want it to be too easy because then there would be a loophole that people could join SPJ to try and get bylaws amendments in. But we also um, don't want um, the board of directors to reject a, pro a proposal that's popular. Um, so we had to have a balance here, um, but we don't want the board forwarding something to the members um, that is not, does not have the full support of the board effectively. Um, so, so we required four, five board members there. Essentially, it needs to be sort of a, you know, oven ready proposal is what we're trying to say. Now, um, we had some excellent input from many, many members um, on these proposals. I do want to single out one, which is a member of ours from Long Island who's a past national board member who recommended a petition. If, um, if you can't get five board members to support advancing this, or if the bylaws committee says that something, um, for example, would be in conflict with our code of ethics and the members disagree, um, they wanted to create a petition process. And uh, what we did is we asked, but also we don't wanna do this, have them just do this ad hoc online because there again, I think that's where I meant to say, you could have someone join just to do sort of an ad hoc online petition. That's where I meant to say that, I'm sorry. Um, so we've required that the chapter leaders and communities first request that the executive director create a petition. And this is the equivalent of the chapters and communities bringing it to the convention now. Um, but with the difference that this is actually going on a ballot to all of SPJ's thousands of members. It's not just going to be discussed by delegates. So um, we're asking they create a petition. And, and this is also to override if the board or the bylaws committee are not advancing it to the ballot um, because they say conflicts with the code of ethics or something. And uh, this member had recommended 250 signatures. Uh, we changed that to, um, let me scroll down to there, 5% of membership. And the reason we did that is 215, 5% are pretty close today, but membership numbers have varied over time. Um, and it, you know, honestly, if membership numbers decline, 250 might start to seem like an unreasonable bar for members to override the board on this. So we left it five, we changed that to 5% of membership. And, and we did run that by the member who brought that 250 figure and he was fine with that. So following a successful petition, this is very important to us, we wanted to make sure that the proposal that was approved by petition, in other words, overriding the board vote, went to the members in exactly the same time and manner and appeared on the ballot in exactly the same way as, as a um, proposal that was forwarded by the board. Um, and then the final thing is that the members get a 30 day notification to read it, discuss it amongst their boards um, and ultimately vote on it on the ballot during um, the convention. Okay, so let me go up to resolutions and code of ethics. And I want to be very clear here. Code of ethics and even the resolutions are not in the current bylaws. This would be a new article um, because without the delegates, I think the members would want some firm guarantee in the bylaws that they would still have this voice on the code of ethics or the bylaws. To be clear now, there's no process in our current 
bylaws explaining how amendments to the code of ethics are approved. Um, and when they were, were last revised in 2014, I think it was the ethics chair at that time made the joke that it was like Haley's comment, amendments to the ethics only come around once every 18 years. Um, so this is not a common practice, but there's nothing in our bylaws now that would prevent a national board from voting on code of ethics changes on its own, except that the delegates would probably then complain at the convention, but they could do that. So this um, in, would enshrine in our bylaws the fact that code of any amendments to the code of ethics need to be ratified in a vote by members. And this is a somewhat simplified process from the bylaws amendments because only the ethics committee may have pro proposed amendments to the society's code of ethics. Um, and they need to do so 125 days. So that's about four months before the annual election. Any, but we put this date in here for a couple of reasons. And one is to inform the members. Any member who wishes to contact the ethics committee can do that then before that deadline, you know, more than four months before the election of the convention. Um, bylaws committee, of course, has to draft them. Here again, we put them out to a public comment period. And this was something that was actually, I was, I was a delegate when we approved them back in 2014. And the delegates at that time mentioned that they would have liked to have had more of a comment period beforehand. And some of them even wanted to ratify them in a member vote. So this would open them up to a 60 day public comment period, just like amendments to the bylaws in this system. And the ethics committee may make changes based on feedback they get during that public comment period. Um, and then it gets referred to the ballot um, in a similar way. It does pass through the board. Um, this is a, a shorter time period and if it passes through the board, the board rejects it. Basically the ethics committee comes back next year with, with new um, proposals. It's not like a bylaws amendment, which changes our document, but then can be redone the following year. And also bylaws commitments may be very necessary to continue the operations if there have been changes at the society or in technology. Okay, so I want to get to resolutions because importantly, okay, we do set, specify these are resolutions not to enact changes to the code of ethics. We specify here that changes to the code of ethics and any dues increase in excess of 5% must be ratified by a membership referendum process. Uh, the 5% we get because that's in our current bylaws. It, it, they currently say that any dues increase above 5% needs to be ratified by the delegates at convention. So we're just moving that to the referendum. Um, have over resolutions not to change the society's code of ethics, um, those originate with the members. That's really grassroots democracy. Um, the board does not have a specific reason to pass a resolution because if the board wants to make a statement or change something, they can do a motion in a meeting as you're doing today. Um, this is that any SPJ member in good standing may go to the resolutions committee. Um, and again, we made this four months before um, the election um, to submit ideas. And it's very important that these not pass through the board, we felt, um, because sometimes these are making public statements about journalism, journalists who've been taken hostage, for example. But sometimes they're actually giving a directive to the board, which like the resolution that created the task force that came out of a, a resolution for the membership. So, and I, by the way, I had a long conversation with the current resolutions committee chair um, to go over these proposals and he did support this petition process and agree with everything. I, I don't know if he's actually on the call today. I can't see that, but, um, but we chatted about this. Um, so, and he said, for example, that he pretty much sent things through now to the delegates that don't conflict with the bylaws or code of ethics. So we included that language. So the resolutions committee will basically forward anything that does not conflict with laws, the bylaws or the code of ethics to the executive director who shall immediately forward the full text of the resolutions to the leaders of chapters and communities in good standing. Um, and then they create a petition basically to show that we've gathered enough support from the leaders of the chapters and communities in good standing to advance this to the ballot. They are the ones that approve sending this to the ballot for all members. Um, and there's one big change here from the current system, um, which, I mean, because you may notice this is a little bit like the way bylaws are done now that can be proposed by chapters, 
but we do not require that they go around and speak to their boards. This is going to be public knowledge that they endorse this. We trust that they will talk to their boards. So we wanted to streamline that process. Any chapter leader can sign this. Also importantly, we, we don't allow an individual to sign it more than one time. So if someone is the leader of a chapter and a community, that individual can sign it. Um, Let's see, is that in here or is that in bylaws? Let me make sure, okay. Yeah. Shall a member who's leader more than, yes, we've got that. Um, and that's based on Robert's rules principles. Um, so once it has the required support of the chapters and communities, it basically gets submitted to a 30 day public comment period. Um, we felt that 30, we wanted to keep, give them time to get through this process and still not have to stretch it out more than four months. So it's a 30 day public comment period for this and it needs to be completed at least 45 days before the election so that the text can be mailed to all members 30 days before the election and appear on the ballot and then all members can can ratify that resolution. So, oh, wait. Alex, Alex, the last thing, let me finish, let me finish this. Balloting on resolutions. This is important. There is a distinction. It is, it is a higher bar to pass amendments to the code of ethics than to pass all other resolutions. The code of ethics is like bylaws. Um, okay, hold on. Resolutions. There we go. Resolutions to approve changes to the code of ethics requires two thirds of member voting, provided that the number of ballots cast on that question is at least 10% of the total cast in the annual election. This is the same language, by the way, that we have for bylaws amendments. I may have glossed over that. Um, first of all, this, this board sent us two thirds for bylaws amendments. Um, and uh, and we came up with the 10%. That was um, probably just to show that there is something like a quorum. We usually have about 20% of members vote on the ballots, um, maybe 1,000, 1,100 members. It's usually between 18 and 19%. Um, 10, so 10% would be basically 100 members. Currently, last year, for example, there were right around 80 individuals who, were, who attended the delegate meeting as delegates. Some of them had multi-votes. But so that 10% is very close to the figure who now attend the delegate meeting. And we're hoping that those people will still be counted on to check the mark of something on the ballot that's important as amendment to the Code of Ethics. However, last thing is we make it easier for resolutions not pertaining to the Code of Ethics. They must only be approved of a majority of members voting on that question. There's no requirement for 10% of the members voting in that election to tick that box. So that is my presentation, bylaws, code of ethics, resolution convention, how we have imagined um, those would be amended to implement the task force recommendations. Okay, now I'm gonna speak. Um, <laughs> and you know, um, and I understand your presentation and you wanna keep focus on your thought process. Going back to the resolutions on the public comment, is there a cutoff period? Hold on. Well, there is, and that it needs to get, this comment period may begin at any time, but must be completed no later than 45 days before the annual election. We, because uh, we need to send the final text to members 30 days beforehand and also get it on the ballot. So we need to give the headquarters staff some time to do that and consider there may be weekends and holidays in there. So there is a 45 day cutoff. However, it can begin at any time. We don't want to cut off public discussion sooner the necessary. So if someone opens this public comment period much earlier, they, then it could stay open for a couple of months, in other words. Um, and the public comment period can include things like, um, you know, the, the, the town halls that, that we have, but it could also be a chat room. That's to be decided. And we say there's a policy that should be written. So. Okay. Also addressing the code of ethics. I um, I like what you you've proposed here i just think that you know when we have you know I, I think every two years and some committees you know the chairs change all the time and i don't you know we have a code of ethics that a lot of people follow i mean you know i see it they'll say on cnn something about the spj code of ethics so you'll see someone else write about it and i think that you know to have a committee chair that can just go in there with the committee they change it i think that having the members have a say is so important uh, because again, it's about fairness and, and even look am among us, we all have different ideas and different opinions. And, and I don't want the code of ethics to be tampered with. Um, and if it's going to be 
Um, if the whole process is going to be made better, I think it, it helps to have members um, have some input. So I really like that part um, to amend the code of ethics. Uh, any, I'm, I'm sorry, are you done? Oh, no, that was my presentation, but I'm obviously available to take questions. Obviously, there's there's a lot of moving parts to amending. A um, lot of moving this is, parts. This is major revision by necessity because you're asking us to replace one current system with a different system. And I think you did a thorough job in looking at every detail. Uh, any, dis any, any board members want to talk about anything here? Want to add their input? Want to add any questions for Alex? Oh, yeah. Any questions? I know it's a lot of information. I'm sorry. I apologize to the members here too, because it is a lot of information to absorb. We've had a few days to, to look at this, um, but it was important, especially for people who are not on the board to see it, to see everything this committee has really just, they just jumped in there and, and just try to make it better. Um, any any discussions? Claire, do you see anybody? I, I do appreciate, um a lot of the checks and balances that you guys have put into this, um, into this, I think it's a lot stronger than it was when we saw it earlier. Um, I, I think the two thirds vote um, um, with the uh, membership threshold who voted, I think is important. Um, um, so I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if like, you know, going to a delegate, having a delegate system or having a one person, one vote system is better um, for a nonprofit. I, I, I don't know. Um, I think you guys address a lot of my concerns and I do think it's important to, um, you know, kind of send this back to, um, send it back to the system and, and have it debated. Um, and so I appreciate the work that you guys have done. Um, again, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the best system um, and I'm not, Sure, I want to give my full endorsement to, you know, saying that I can definitively say this will make SBJ healthier. But I do want to, you know, acknowledge the work that you guys have done, um, and do think that it is in a place where I think it can go back to the floor for debate. So I appreciate it. Thank you out for all of your work, Alex, and the rest of the committee. And Danielle, I'm hearing your input as someone who's been a member of different organizations that have no delegate system. We're the only journalism organization right now that has a delegate system. And I keep hearing, I saw an email earlier from someone in the group that said, you know, oh, Rebecca's getting rid of democracy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Democracy is we all have a voice. And some of these, some of the delegates, just look at the past two delegate meetings. Let me just be frank. You know, there is no inclusion. It is predominantly white. And that is one of the things that bothers me the most about the delegate system. So for that person out there that says there's no democracy, that, you know, I've heard of everything, Rebecca's being a Mussolini, come on. Come on, we need a voice. And for anybody here that believes the delegate system, join another organization. Look at NHJ, look at IRE, look at them. They don't have delegate systems. Each one of us, you know what? I think that each member out there for 75 bucks should have their own say. This is not 1922. This is 2022, where people who look like me can come to the table. I've been in those delegate meetings. I remember fighting in 2010 or in New Orleans about don't use the word illegal aliens. I remember seeing a sea of white delegates. I'm like, oh, it was, whoa. So maybe you look at it in that perspective, but as a woman of color, as someone that needs my voice there, I think it's important. And I would recommend to you, Danielle, go to the other organization, see how it's worked, one member, one vote. Because I know that as a woman, as a Latina, as a mother of someone who's in the LGBTQ community, as someone who has just fought for a lot in 41 years. It is time to stop living in the past and live in the present. And don't be afraid of people who look like me because a lot of it, I think it's the optics. You know, we, you know, the, the, the people that I see, I mean, you should see the emails that have been sent to me by sources the fabricated information out there, the pure lies just to keep this delegate system is disgusting. It is disgusting because this is SPJ and I love the members who voted in a board of six people, I mean, nine people, six people of color, one trans woman, never happened before. 
And in the delicate process, we're not included sometimes. So I say to you, please, please, Danielle, go and, go and talk to the people from my area. Go to the people, you know, to NABJ, NHJ, AAJA, you name it. It's work for them. Let's stop living in a past. Stop fearing that, you know, there's going to be a takeover. Oh my gosh, you, you know, I'll tell you, I'm going to write a book. And some of these emails are going to be included because I think some people think the Latinos are going to take over. We're not. We're still a, a minority in this organization. So that's why I'm so passionate about this because I want everybody, young people. You know, we have 21 year olds, 22 years old, and I get it. You know, I'm 64 years old. I'm going to be 65. I'm, I'm on the other side already, you know? But I want new voices to come in. And those new voices believe in freedom of speech, freedom of representation. And I think this delegate system, I'm sorry, it's old, it's old. And me and, and, and I, I hope that we get rid of it. I'm just gonna be that honest. All right, anybody else? I wanna say a few words really quickly. Um, I'm out the train so you won't hear the, the announcements. Um, I also uh, agree with your, um, a lot of what you said, Rebecca, and thank you, Alex, for that very thorough and insightful report. Like you really hands down you and the team um, really went to task in, in making sure all the details are included so that the membership, the board and the membership gets the information that they need so they can make a wise and informed decision. Um, we do need new voices. We do need inclusive voices. And this is something that's across the board. We can't fear change change is actually a good thing. And once you're informed, you can make good decisions. When you don't know, that's when you will be fearful and will make unwise decisions. So I rather know and be able to uh, advise my peers, advise the students that are coming up, the up and coming journalists who wanna get into this field that is tough. So I really agree with making changes. I really want it to happen. Um, I'm on board with that. And for those who fear things happening, ask us questions, go to meetings. Um, we're here for you. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Very well said. And yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things is that as journalists, let me just add a few things here because I, I need to, to express myself in this. As journalists, all of you who are on these private listservs where there's these lengthy emails and there's fabricated information, yeah, I've been called a dictator. Be journalists. Get the who, what, where, and when. When you see a piece of information from someone who allegedly is an institutional person here, come and ask me. I don't bite. I'm a friendly person. I mean, people approach me. Ask me, is this true what I'm seeing here? Or is this a fabrication? This board has worked hard. You guys know I'm not about politics. I'm gonna be a positive and productive, that's all it is. Whatever happened in the past is a past. This is a new day. This is why you see, I don't know, you know, John's there. We've, we've gained maybe 1400 new members. We've gotten a lot done. Let's keep pushing forward. Stop with the noise in the back. Gosh, that takes up so much energy. You know, it just does. Again, you know, I, I see the same people, negative, negative, never. Man, if you guys don't like it, leave, leave. But, you know, I, as I said before, if you're not pitching, stop your pitching. That's what I said to a lot of people who don't bring stories to the table, so I use it with you. So anyway, anyway, any other board members? Anybody? Feel free, you know me, I have a freedom of speech here. Claire, do you I, see it? I honestly don't know where to start. Um, the the um, some of the emails that I've seen uh, troubled me a great deal, um, and and I don't want to uh, spend too much time on them. I'd rather spend time on this proposal and what it does and what it does not do. What it does not do is take power away from the membership. What it does do is take power away from an elite group that is not representative of the membership. And, and this elite group, the delegate system, we're coming to the delegate system hat in hand saying, disband yourselves because you're not representing SPJ's membership. How do I know that? Because I am. 
and I am not included or I was not included in last year's meeting because I'm not a delegate. I don't understand that. I went out, I got all these votes from members, but because I didn't play the political game at the political uh, point that I should have played it, uh, I'm locked out of the delegate meeting. I'm a member of this association. When the question is coming up on the bylaws, I should have a vote, period. That's not because I'm um, on the board. It's because I paid my dues. And every single member who paid his dues should have their voice represented when there's a change in the bylaws, when there's a change in ethics, when there's a change in, in, in any of these policies that, that we're trying to work on here. What has happened is we have grown up as a fraternity and we are now moving in a direction that allows more people to vote. When you allow more people to vote, the same voices always get up and make the same objections. Well, if you let just anybody vote, how do you know they're gonna be informed? How do you know they're gonna be up on the issues? And, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not reading, but I am relaying a specific message that I received about that. What, what happens if somebody uh, wants to vote on an issue but doesn't know every single detail? You know, the same objections that were raised in the 50s and 60s when we were trying to keep other people from voting in a different context. So I heard Rebecca raise um, a, uh, a racial um, uh, uh, ethnic element to this. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to say it, it made me a little uncomfortable, but it made me uncomfortable because I understand where it's coming from and I don't think everybody else did. That was a response. Don't think for a second she's injecting race into this. Race no, no, was let me, injected let me make into it very clear. Yeah, I let me make it very clear. There's an emails out there, guys. I know, this I know. And, why, and again, I'm not at liberty to say who this individual is, but to write something in writing that, you know, that, that makes it look like basically NHJ is gonna run this organization. That's really sad because you should be better than that. You should Rebecca, be better you than and that. I, <laughs> you and I are on the same page in that observation. I, I was trying to make it clear because you were responding to something without telling people what you were responding to. Yeah, and I'm I trying to, to make it clear that, that yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, this, uh, Rafael, are you finished? I'm sorry, I don't want to jump on you. I, I, I think that I would never finish, so I'm going to cut myself short. Here. Okay, here's the thing. Um, here's the thing, you know, I mean, Look, you know, one of the things that Jennifer Ellis said, we need more transparency. I'm being transparent, guys. These are the kind of emails I get. But the beauty about SPJ is I look at me being the first Latina woman of color to be the president now in 113 years. It says that we, despite this little group of, I think, 25 people, remember, we're 6,000 members, despite this little group that has this tight hold or think they do, look at our membership. We are a strong board. Again, six people of color, nine, you know, nine great journalists, one trans woman. We are a strong group because why? We have a great membership who says we're living in the present. Right now, and I want to go back, I'm at the SPJ Regional 11 Conference. There's 150 people here. There's people from the LA Times, TV stations. People were coming up saying, your board is doing great. I, I never got involved because I always felt like National didn't care. I mean, you guys, I, I, I swear it makes me very emotional because they're here and they're so proud of what we're doing. And, and somebody just from the New York Newsweek yesterday emailed me, hey, hey, three of us are coming to, we're coming to your conference. We're gonna be there. And I'm thinking, what? They never go to conferences, but they're coming to our conference. We have people like Jim Acosta who's going, hey, I'm gonna be on your panels and you know other people. Claire is doing a great job. So I say to you that we, despite what these people say, because you know what, to those people that say, you know, lies and, you know, try to say I'm a dictator, you know what, say what you want. Bottom line is I've proven and my board has proven that we can do the job. Yes, you have. And, yeah. And, and I eliminate noise because as a Latina, as a little kid, I remember picking tomatoes and seeing those white people who try to keep me down. And look at me now. And the beauty of our organization is that we have wonderful, wonderful members. I am so proud of our membership because we're very diverse. And even though we're the majority white, those people are saying, we're not just talking diversity and inclusion. Look at our president, look at our board members. 
Look at them. And that's what I say to those people out there who create gossip and noise. I hear you. I'm not listening really though. I'm not. All right, anybody else? Anybody else? All right. I gotta say this, Alex Draquenio, you are an amazing person. You're in your committee. I'm looking this, all the red, all the blue. I have a headache. Uh, my head is mush. But I appreciate that you put it in simple terms so I can understand it because I know, and I'm sure some of my board members would agree, when I opened up the document, I was like, oh, no. Oh, my God, I can't. But you made it very, you and your committee really, really put some great work into this. And I think that we're going to, again, live in the present, make things better. And I appreciate that. I really do. Um, okay, so I'm going to turn to my parliamentarian to give me some guidance. Uh, so do we, uh, give me some guidance. Do we kind of, are we supposed to vote to approve all these or, or how does it work? Yes, Madam President. So what I'm doing right now, as you were talking, I was uh, typing into the chat. Uh, and so the question is, is there a motion by the board to adopt the amendments to the SPJ bylaws uh, as to the delegate analysis task force? That would be, and so I'm putting it there. Hold on, sorry, I misspelled. Um, so, um, so therefore, uh, as, as the chair, uh, this is the question that you would uh, put to the board. Uh, there would have to be a motion, uh, a second, and then there would be a discussion and debate on the question. Uh, Madam President, I have a point of clarification. Are you voting first on addendum A and then on addendum, by the way, addendum B would be far quicker. Um, but are you, are you voting on them separately or are you voting to authorize sending the whole thing through? I'm a little unclear, Israel, because can, can we do <laughs> it's both? been a long time since you had that motion. I mean, there's no, I haven't heard any discussion from some of the board members okay. saying that I or, think both of them. You could vote uh, on both because uh, uh, there, uh, there's not much to addendum B other than a few paragraphs that would be back in because the delegate system would continue. Israel? So, to, yeah, so to answer uh, the question from uh, the chair of the bylaws committee, so we've had already two votes on different issues. So the way that the procedure has moved is that the chair of the bylaws has made a presentation and the board has voted on that presentation. So what we are voting on is the presentation that has been made since the second vote that we took uh, now roughly about an hour and 15 minutes. All right. Everything that the chair of the bylaws committee has made as far as the presentation from that last vote, that is the question right now that is that that you would uh, move to the floor and then uh, there would be a, a motion. Does that clarify to my colleague from the chair of the bylaws? Yes, All right. it does. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. So is there a motion by the board to adopt the amendments to the SPJ bylaws as to the delegate analysis task force? Board members? Somebody has to make a motion. Sorry, I'll make, I'll make that motion. I was trying to find my unmute. OK, Emily makes a motion. Second? I'll second, Daniela. Daniela. So the question is now on the floor for discussion and debate. All right, the discussion and debate on these um, issues that Alex just talked to us about. Anybody? Daniela McLean, anything? <laughs> Any questions? No, I, I, I put it in the group chat, but I, I appreciate all of your perspectives and share your desire to make SPJ more uh, diverse and inclusive. And, uh, I'm proud of the uh, diversity um, on this board and its commitment to achieving that. Um, I haven't seen the emails that you guys have referenced, but I'm just the first. You don't want to. Uh, uh, first, first of all, Danielle McClain, you, you, you have been an asset on this board uh, you. because of your representation. You know, as you know, my son is a, a part of the LGBTQ community and uh, that is a voice that's also needed. No, thank Seriously. you. And I, and I I just say, I, I don't know what the perfect, what I was saying earlier is I just don't know what the perfect system is. Do your research. That's all I think. Um, I've been a part of like other nonprofits. I know they're also not perfect, but I support this because of the work that the committee did and bring this forward, incorporating concerns and kind of that level of like thought to trying to make this more inclusive. And I really do believe that it um, deserves a de um, debate on the floor. So thank you. Yeah. 
And again, I, I just say, since you're a journalist, go, you know, call all those other people and say, hey, how's it working since you guys don't have a delegate system? And believe me, I think your, your eyes will open up real wide. So thank you. Anybody else, any more discussion on this? Anybody, Claire? <laughs> I'm just calling people out. <laughs> all right, anybody you. else, anybody else? Okay, all right. So um, Israel, so we can just take a vote on this, person by person? Uh, so you close, close the question or close, on the floor? Uh, anybody uh, else? Any question, debate, talk? Yeah, I'm closing the discussion on this one. And then, uh, so the motion has been made, the question is before the floor. And so I would recommend again that you take a roll call. Claire, can you do that for us, please? Yep. President Rebecca Aguilar? Yes. Claire Regan, yes. Aveta Villa Richards? Hell yes. <laughs> Israel Balderas? Israel Balderas abstains due to his role as parliamentarian at the SPJ conference. Emily Block? Yes. Daniela Ibarra? Yes. Danielle McLean? Yes. Rafael Almeida? Si. And Cheryl Smith? What Yvette said. Yes. <laughs> right, thank you. muted uh, Rebecca. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, anyway, the motion passes, eight uh, for the motion and one abstention. So thank you so much. Alex, anything else you'd wanna add now that we're done with the voting? Um, well, yes, that my understanding is we only voted on agenda A and you need to vote on agenda B. I can make that a very quick presentation, but my understanding is we only voted on my presentation at that point. That's um, correct. That's correct. Okay, so this will be very quick because, as I explained earlier, okay. Agenda B includes all of the changes in Agenda A that are unrelated to the delegate system. So everything we discussed already, uh, fellows, even associate members, etc., would be in Agenda B. But the difference is um, that should the delegates vote to retain uh, the delegate system, all of those paragraphs, those sections that would have been cut in Addenda A pertaining to that would be in Addenda B, and there'll be some mild editing. And I say mild, most of it's, I mean, there's a lot of clarity in housekeeping. Just my um, uh, qualification at the beginning, none of this is to reform, quote unquote, the delegate system, um, because if the delegates decide to go that route, I think that would probably be a, a separate task force and certainly the bylaws committee this year was not tasked with that. So I just, uh, I will point out a few things and you can vote up or down. As I said, many of these changes you've already seen like the associates, that's all, already been discussed. Um, there's some cross references that are different because of course the numbering is different. Oh, the other thing is in this final vote, you might also uh, give the bylaws, empower the bylaws committee to fix any things like cross-referencing or copying, because this was done very hastily, as, as Danielle pointed out, we were adding checks and balances up to the end. This would not change the substance of it, though. Okay. Um, obviously, the board of directors, there's a couple things that are in A that would not be in B, saying they can forward resolutions and bylaws to reference by the members. The, the first thing that's really different is the convention. All of these changes are together. Okay, the convention. Obviously, those sections that are in the current Article 10 would remain about allocating delegates, for example. Um, and there's only there's a numbering problem, which is actually not because of our work. That's a numbering um, improper cross-reference in the current bylaws on the website. There's one change here, which is is significant. Might be something you want to discuss. We have uh, voting must be done by accredited delegates with your accredited alternate delegates. The current bylaws specify present on the floor of the convention. And we would change that to in person or participating remotely if such means are made available to the delegates at the convention. Uh, what we wanted to do here was leave the option for future boards um, and staff 
should the delegate system continue to hold either because you know that had to be more or less suspended during the um during the pandemic to hold either a fully virtual a fully in person or a hybrid um convention for the delegate meetings um currently it says present on the floor you had to submit uh, suspend that during um during the pandemic so this would basically give options but doesn't require um there's no requirement in the bylaws that they do any one of those three we've already discussed the headquarters we've decided to leave that in um if the delegates want to debate this in future they can at the in october i mean but they can't vote on it because we're going to leave that in um so that's one change after today's meeting ah this is an important one i mean you can see it read our notes here um one recommendation in the task force and another one that was unrelated to the initial question of the delegate system was to require headquarters to um improve the membership records and chapter and community records um, and we looked at and, and actually when you pass that in your meeting in june you specifically said we're not sending that to the bylaws committee it's just something that we want the headquarters to do however my committee looked at the um the section uh the cur current article 12 and saw that actually it, it is not a requirement of the executive director at this time it's obviously something that the board requires the executive director to do, but it's not spelled out in the bylaws and most executive directors will consult the bylaws when they want to understand their duties. So we recommend this addition where it says currently says keep complete accounts, you know, and then semicolon and report we we would insert and membership records. And that was something that was um, recommended by another member of the committee and we adopted and we feel that it addresses number five in um, the delegate task force report. Um, and uh, there we just move something around and make it easier to read that sentence. That's not a substantive change. Um, oh, yes, Quill. <laughs> and we do have a few members from the um, foundation board on this call. Uh, I'm not certain everyone knows. I think most of you know that Quill is now managed by SPJ. Uh, but there are a couple of things that are obsolete, but it is still received, the, the, the physical magazine by all members of good standing. There are a couple of references, however, uh, to Quill in the bylaws that are now obsolete based on current practices. Um, members holding, they're called lifetime members, so we added that because that's what they're called now. Holding lifetime memberships shall pay a one-time fee, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this is probably very old and an annual subscription fee for Quill. I don't think that's been paid for a long time and I don't anticipate there's any desire to add an annual subscription fee for that. There's one other reference to Quill that I may have glossed over up here in the chapters section. Okay. Chapters and communities. Okay. There is a reference to a Quill correspondent which is probably quite old. And I ran this by uh, our executive director, John, and he confirmed that this term is not used by the staff or by anyone working on Quill now. Previously, but I think it's been many, many years, maybe decades, um, there was a term called the Quill correspondent and chat. That was the person on the chapter board who would send in items uh, for Quill. I believe at that time Quill was a monthly magazine and much of the content was actually chapter news. Now, you know, because of changes in technology, printing costs, et cetera, that has all been moved more online. That takes place on the website and especially on social media. And I don't believe any of the chapters or the headquarters use the term Quill correspondent anymore. We recommend taking it out because A, to conform with current practices, but also, um, uh, also, just, you know, people, new members, when they're reading the bylaws, they may feel left out or like they're missing something if they read that and it doesn't conform with current practices. By the way, this is a change that's in both A and B, but it was not one of the ones that I had singled out. Um, so we recommend taking out Quill in both places and also because Quill is, is managed by the foundation now. It's, it's not an SPJ society thing. Okay, so jumping ahead to the amendments, which of course is always a the last article. Um, I just want to point out that our 
committee, and I think many people have found the current Article 14 confusing. Um, and our goal here was not to change um, the procedures. And if the delegates vote to keep the system, that is something that they would look at if they decide to go down the reform route. Um, we actually got these changes from um, the immediate past bylaws chair. And the purpose is to keep the original intent, but to clarify it so that the members reading this section, they will understand. For example, I thought, I think many people thought that the reference in the current bylaws to a referendum meant a referendum of all members. But in fact, um, as the previous bylaws chair explained, it's a referendum of leaders of chapters. Um, so basically these are clarifications. They do not change current procedures, but they might make it a little easier for um, members trying to interpret the bylaws themselves um, to understand. So that is um, addendum B. So to be clear, if you vote to send both addendum a and B, both addenda to, to the delegates, they'd be able to read and vote on amendments to either A or B and vote either A or B down, up or down. And that's my presentation. <laughs> Voila. Thank you so much. Again, a lot to absorb, everybody. Um, turning to my parliamentarian, I guess we can, uh, does, I'm sorry, does anybody on the board have any questions for Alex on this part? I know it's a lot, everybody, I know. Madam, uh, a point of privilege, because uh, yeah. I'm trying to abstain as much as possible, but I, I do want to bring it to your attention so you at least um, go back. I know you were addressing some members on the chat, so you might have missed it. And, and, and I think it's at least worth clarifying since we have several um, SBJ members. Um, there is a change to uh, proposed uh, change to the bylaws regarding uh, that the uh, votes to the uh, convention floor have to be made uh, there in person. Uh, if, if again, if uh, Alex can point that out again, and, but she did make a statement that I'm quite not clear. Maybe um, the chairwoman from the bylaws committee can point to that. But she did say that that section of the bylaws has been suspended. And, and again, I was curious as to what was the power that the board used in order to suspend the bylaws? You know, that's a very interesting question, Israel. I don't know because I was not a member of the board. I was actually involved on the conference planning committee for the past three in-person conferences. Those were the years I was um, what we at least used to call on the ladder, secretary, treasurer, president, elector, president. Uh, the two years since I left the board, uh, the conference has been virtual. And I was, um, my understanding as a member, so bear in mind, I was not a board member at that time. My understanding, because the, Bylaws call for present on delegates, alternate des delegates present on the floor. So I was curious how the delegates were even able to meet in those years. And um, it may in fact have been our executive director said that the board at that time, and in fact, Rebecca was a board member at that time, voted to suspend the bylaws. I'm not quite certain how that was done. This change would give future boards flexibility to hold either all virtual, all in person or hybrid delegate meetings without having to suspend the bylaws, which I always feel a little uncomfortable about, by the way, just as a member hearing that boards are suspending bylaws. Um, and by the way, Rebecca, I just want to throw that back to you because again, I was not a member of the board when that was done. Yeah, and the suspension was because of the pandemic. I mean, we weren't going to be able to be on any floor convention floor, right? So we had to do uh, a virtual, um, the delegate, as you, you saw for the past two years, that instead of on the floor. So I hope that clarifies that. It was just, the pandemic pushed us into a whole different area. Of course, we're not into suspending bylaws. This is a different time. And you know, we weren't gonna meet in person. Well, at, at the moment, I remember people thought hard to go to New Orleans, but then at the last minute, the hurricane came with the pandemic and we switched things up and that's why. So we're not uh, no board. And even back then, they're not lying about, oh, let's suspend the bylaws. No, the pandemic and, and then the hurricane uh, created that in, you know, the first year with Patty Newberry as a president. Um, again, the situation was the pandemic. So, so it was due to emergency. The circumstance was an yeah, emergency. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank yes. you for clarification. Yeah, Appreciate we weren't going to meet in person in, anywhere. All right. Um, any other questions about this? 
So uh, going to uh, you, Israel. Is, yes. Back, I just a point of clarification. I feel that's the only major. I mean, now that I look at the changes as I read them out, most of them were already in A, which you approved. I feel the only change of any substance between A and B, besides of course putting the delegates back in, is that change present on the floor? Yeah. I, FYI. I have, <laughs> okay. I have a question. So. Uh, the final draft of the amendments, when will those be posted? I mean, is there a deadline to, for that to be met? Because I know, you know, we're always- Yeah, of... this week. So after um, this meeting, you know, early this week, I, I'll make the changes we discussed, for example, leaving heck, we had discussed whether to recommend, not recommend, whether to send through the possibility of leaving, you know, taking the headquarters section out. We decided not to do that. Uh, we also need to look through for housekeeping things. There were a lot of revisions earlier this week. As Danielle pointed out, there were several drafts that this went through to insert checks and balances. We want to make sure all the cross references are still valid, things like that. Nothing of substance, but you know, just making sure that this is accurate will be sent to the delegates. That needs to go out this week. I think, oh God, I'm getting very tired. What is the date by the 27th of this month? But really, ideally it might be nice if it went out in time for leads. But we have basically until the end of the week to inform all the members. Um, and Jennifer Royer, I mean, I've, that's up to basically the board, um, the executive director, and the communications director how that goes out. But uh, but yeah, I'll need to clean up, make those changes, put the you know the headquarters back in. That's the main one, and um, show it to my committee, give them one more chance to check the cross references and all that. But you know, you'll have it early this week, and then it goes out to members. Um, definitely by the end of this week all right there you have it everybody who's waiting you'll get it by this week um, and just to clarify by the way i want your final board vote to make sure that you say at there is one amendment technically that you've made which is that the um report online does take out the section about headquarters which we're going to leave in um and that the bylaws committee is free to make you know housekeeping changes um such as correcting, you know, cross references, as long as they aren't substantive changes. We're not going to obviously make those at this point. Ma Madam, uh, point of order, Madam President, to what yes. Alex just, uh, sorry, uh, what the chair from the bylaws committee just made, that would have to be a second, a second, uh, a different vote. We cannot vote on two issues at the same time. So if Alex, if the chair from the bylaws committee is recommending to the board that, that we take a vote as to the, 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 the bylaws committee cleaning up, I would make a suggestion to you that you take one vote on addendum B, which only includes that section of changing the bylaws to uh, make it more um, uh, open to both in person and out. So you need to have one vote on that. Then what Alex just said, you'd have to have a second vote. A second vote on? On, on giving the authority to the bylaws to make cleanup changes. So that way it doesn't have to come before the board again. That's what, that's what she just asked right now. And I, and, I, and, and I just wanna make sure that we can't put that into this vote that we're about to take, because that's a separate, se it's a separate question. And we can't take, uh, we so can't- we take, So we take a vote on amendment- B On addendum B. With which, the changes of the bylaws that they're more open and- That's correct. As, as she just said, the only, the only thing we're really voting on, uh, and the chair from the bylaws can correct me, I think you just said this. The, and, and if you wanna put it to, if you, if you wanna scroll down, so that all the SBJ members present on this call can see what you're talking about, mm -hmm. right there, right. So all we're doing right now, if you if you you know ask the question to the board, this is what we're voting on for this okay. question right now. All right. So who would like to um, would like to do a motion um, for this vote? Any board member, jump in. I'll make the motion, Rebecca. It's Claire. All right. Second. I'll second Daniela. Yeah. No. All right. Okay. So we can debate it now. That's a qu there's a question on the floor for now. Uh, uh, debate and discussion. Debate on discussion on this. The uh, changes to the bylaws to make more open out there. Anybody? Any discussion? I don't want to call out board members, so just let me know. Claire, watch out. I don't see any hands from the board members now. All right. No one wants to debate and talk about this. Um, not that you don't want to, but you don't have anything. Okay. So uh, we'll close the discussion on this. 
Okay, so the question before the floor is, will the board, uh, you're voting on the changes uh, as to um, section four, uh, voting must be done by accredited delegates or the accredited alternate delegates in person or participating remotely if such means are made available to the delegates at all at the convention. That's the question before the floor. If you want to take a roll call, Madam President. Go ahead, uh, Claire. Okay, President Rebecca Aguilar. Yes. Claire Regan, yes. Yvette Davila Richards. Yes. Israel Balderas. Israel Balderas abstains due to my role as parliamentarian at the SPJ conference. Emily Block. Yes. Daniela Ibarra. Yes. Danielle McLean. Yes. Rafael Almeida. Yes. And Cheryl Smith. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. The motion passes with eight votes. Yes, one abstention. All right, we're going to vote on. Now we can vote on the second one. Is so you? now, so uh, the chair from the bylaws committee uh, made a request that the board uh, vote to give the power to the bylaws committee to go ahead and make just changes that she called uh, cleaning up uh, and making point references. So they need that authority so that those changes they don't go to the heart of making uh, amendments to the bylaws. So if we just vote that way, uh, the bylaws chair has that power uh, before these have to be posted by, uh, you know, September, August 28th, but you can do the 27th, as she said. All right, who would like to do that motion? I'll make that motion. And uh, Madam President, I believe that that could probably be a yay or nay vote, unless Israel says otherwise. Um, I, I will I will have to again do an abstention. So I would at least advise since the procedure the whole time has been roll call vote to just maintain that for the sake of process and procedure. And consistency. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. All right. Uh, Emily made the motion. Who would like to second it, please? Second. Second by Cheryl Smith. All right. Let's do the vote, Claire. Uh, President Rebecca Aguilar. Yes. Claire Regan, yes. Yvette Villa Richards. Yes. Israel Balderas. Israel Balderas abstains from this vote due to his role as parliamentarian at SPJ conference. Emily Block. Emily, could you unmute and say it one more time? Sorry, yes. Got it. Okay, thanks. Daniela Ibarra. Yes. Daniel McLean. Yes. Rafael Almeida. Yes. And Cheryl Smith. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. The motion passes with eight yes, one abstention. All right. So is there anything else, Alex? Um, you know, yeah, is there anything else? No, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna say that concludes my report. Thank you very much to the board. All right. Uh, you can take us out of a shared screen, please. Thank you, Alex, to you and your committee. Please pass along your, um, you know, just let them know that we appreciate the committee. We we appreciate the hard work you put into this. And again, they will be posted this week, correct? This, this coming week? Yes. All right. And and that is the, what, what what's the mandated date just that? Because I'm seeing right here real quick, I saw that Bob said September 28th is the deadline for 60 days. Um, it's August 28th. August 28th. I was mistaken. It, uh, Israel was correct. It is August 28th. It's 60 days. All right, Bob. All right. I, I got a little confused with that, but Bob, thank you. All right. I, I thank, you, thank you, John, for correcting that. All right. So we're done with this business and, uh, you know, trying to get through this. I appreciate everybody who came to our meeting today. I will hope you go and enjoy your your Saturday. We're going to go into executive session because we have to decide on some awards. So Alex Duquenio, thank you. Please tell your committee that our board and our membership thanks you for the hard work that you put into these, these bylaw changes or amendments. Uh, thank you so much. So we're going to go into executive session. John, we'll let you guys know via email and Twitter when we're coming back. We're just going to come back, probably say goodbye. But if you want to come back and look at us say goodbye, feel free to come back. Um, can somebody give me a motion to go in, I guess, into executive session? Correct. It's all a blur. Correct. Executive right. session. Who, who I make the motion for us to go into executive session. All right. Yvette Davila Richards made the I'll motion. Second that. Emily, Emily. Second that. We're going to go into executive session and we're going to stop recording.
And by we say yay. yes. Everybody, yes? Yes. yes. All right, yes. no nays? Any abstentions? Unanimous. Unanimous, thank you. Let's go into, all right. Is this your last board meeting with us, John? Yes. Congratulations on your new job. I hope you have a great time and it's so good that you get to stay in Indianapolis because that's a nice city. So thank you for, for organizing all these board meetings for us, for making sure we're at Zoom, here we are, and giving us all the information you need. And I'm sure the, the rest of the board is, is just as thankful as I am. Um, all right, guys, um, anybody, anyone, anybody want to have a motion to close this uh, board meeting? I make the motion to close today's uh, meeting, all right. today's SPJ board meeting. Thank you, Yvette. Um, who wants to second? I'll Just, second. Who, who's, who's second? Rafael. Okay, so uh, second by Rafael. Uh, all in favor of closing this board meeting, say yay. 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 Any nays or abstentions? All right. Go enjoy your Saturday, everybody. Thank you All for right. everything. Have Go a good have fun at Region 11. I will. I'll tell everybody you guys said hello. All Bye right. Bye. Have everyone. Hello, Shantia. Say hi. Bye. Bye. Bye.